At number 10 is Sam Wilson, AKA the Falcon. Thank you to Rodney Lindsay 849 for suggesting him in part one of the series. Sam Wilson is the guy who became the new Captain America after Steve Rogers hung up his shield. But here's the thing, in the Avengers, even though he took on Cap's mantle, he's not exactly getting the spotlight he deserves. See, Steve Rogers, the OG captain, is a tough act to follow, no doubt. But Sam's got the heart, the skills, and the wings to match. Match. He's proven himself time and time again, but fans still don't give him the credit he's due. Let's not forget, he's carrying on the legacy of Captain America himself, and that's no small task. But nevertheless, Wilson's a great successor. This guy's got some mad skills. He can fly like a boss with those wingsuit thingies. Plus, he's got his vibranium shield that he rocks just as good as Captain. But for some reason, he's often just pushed to the sidelines. At number nine is White Tiger. Thank you to Victor Sage underscore. You might not have heard much about her and that's honestly a real shame. White Tiger, AKA Ava Ayala, made her appearance in the Ultimate Spider-Man and some Lego Marvel games. She's got a pretty cool backstory too, being the sister of Hector Ayala, the original White Tiger. But here's the thing, she's been kind of left in the shadows. With her agility, strength, and that insanely underrated mystical amulet she's got, she's got the potential to be a real force on the Avengers team. There's also that whole fling with Peter Parker that fans seem to be really really into. So it's high time we get to see more of White Tiger in action. She's got what it takes to be one of the strongest Avengers, and it's about time she got the recognition she deserves. If you're enjoying this video so far, please support the channel by pressing like, subscribing to Top 10 Nerd, and ringing that notification bell. I would really appreciate it. Number 8, Firestorm. Where do we even start with Firestorm? The main version of the character is Ronnie Raymond, who is fused with his professor, Martin Stein. But there are a lot of other versions of Firestorm, a lot of whom are either one person or different fusions of other people. It's annoyingly complex. The character, as you might guess, has pyrokinetic abilities plus durability, flight, reflexes, and super strength. But the character's main thing is that they can rearrange the molecules of matter. Now this ability is obviously incredibly OP and it would simply take one story to make him completely god level, but for the most part, writers kind of misuse him. Potentially, this character could transform form entire planets into whatever he wanted. With this power, Firestorm's done some pretty godlike things. For example, Firestorm manifested a pink bunny mascot suit out of thin air around the villain's skull crusher. He's turned explosions into a jack-in-the-box and a cement truck into a giant teddy bear. It's kind of hilarious, but like low key, absolutely insane. On a way less hilarious note, he also turned a girl into salt when he was resurrected as Deathstorm. And in Doomsday Clock, Firestorm accidentally turned a crowd of Russian protesters into glass. But outside of matter manipulation, Firestorm has had some impressive feats, like surviving the nuclear meltdown that originally created the hero and absorbing all the access radiation. And another Another time, Firestorm survived a straight-on nuclear explosion. An alternate version of the character called Deathstorm was able to absorb and capture three different Justice League teams into its own Firestorm matrix. And in Infinite Crisis, Firestorm was able to seal a multiversal rift. In case you haven't noticed, we have kind of moved away from physically unstoppable characters to characters that are just pure science fiction gods. Number seven, John Constantine. John Constantine is a really fun inclusion for this list because he is extremely powerful and not powerful at all at the same time. John can wield magic for sure through years and years of learning, training, traveling, but he doesn't have any kind of magical affinity or any kind of beneficial magical family heritage. John relies on actual magic as a very last resort, and the magic he knows how to use isn't anything to scoff at. He has even, very momentarily, been able to hold back Dr. Fate, but using magic comes at a cost, and he knows this. So what Constantine prefers is trickery. Lies, deceit, traps, his wits, weapons, artifacts, backup, and calling in favors. John smokes, he drinks, he's in his middle ages, and he ain't in the greatest of health. He can throw a punch, for sure, but most people are a physical match for him. But at the same time, he has been able to trick, outsmart, or overpower gods 
demons, and angels. Batman, Superman, Darkseid, Swamp Thing, Doctor Fate, the Phantom Stranger, the Spirit of Justice, the Spectre, the Spirit of Vengeance, Lucifer, and even the Presence, who is basically DC's version of God. He tricked them all. He tricked the Presence into curing John of cancer and granting him divine protection by selling his soul to three separate Hell Lords who would start a civil war over his soul, which would spill out onto Earth and into Heaven. Don't sleep on this bad-mouthed middle-aged man. Number six. Atom Smasher. Thanks to exposure to radiation, Atom Smasher is already an incredibly impressive looking guy. He stands at seven foot six inches tall and he is jacked. This guy's bicep is probably bigger than my torso, which isn't really saying much, but his real power is being able to grow even bigger. He has the power of atomic dispersal, meaning he is able to control the distance between his atoms, increasing to anywhere from 28 to 60 feet in height. His mass, durability, strength, speed, and stamina are all increased even more so as he grows. Now, Albert Rothstein made his superhero debut under a different name. Initially, Al went by the superhero alias of Nuclon, and he was an original member of the superhero team called Infinity Inc. But following in his godfather, the Atom's footsteps, Albert took on his Atom Smasher name and joined up with the Justice Society of America in JSA number one by James Robinson. The thing about Atom Smasher that makes me think he deserves better is his entire interaction with Black Adam. When Black Adam joined the JSA, one of its members that he happened to get close with was Atom Smasher, and he even convinced Smasher to leave the team and start an anti-hero team instead, which led Smasher down a darker path, even becoming part of the Suicide Squad for a time. He has been redeemed since, but I don't think he ever really deserved that in the first place. Number five, Hawkman. Hawkman is a doozy to talk about. Essentially, he has two main origins. He was either a space cop or a reincarnated prince, and sometimes both. Basically, Hawkman's secret identity is Carter Hall, an archeologist and a museum creator who is actually a reincarnation of the ancient Egyptian prince, Khufu. Now Khufu, who would become known as Hawkman, discovered an alien spacecraft from the planet Thanagar powered by an anti-gravity element called the Nth Metal which transformed his soul and doomed him and his love to be reincarnated over and over again throughout time. Some of his incarnations include Brian Kent, the Silent Knight from 5th century Britain, Conrad von Grimm, the son of a blacksmith in 14th century Germany, Captain John Smith of the 16th century English colony in Virginia, Hannibal Hawks, the Nighthawk in the American Old West, Detective James Wright, a Pinkerton detective in the early 20th century, and finally, Carter Hall himself. Whether it's because of his really confusing origins or maybe because people don't realize how cool this character actually is, he just kind of seems to suck. And when I was a kid, I thought he was super cool. Oh, to be an innocent sweet child again. Number four, Raven. Teen Titans and Teen Titans Go! brought the new Teen Titans to a big audience. And one character who really stood out is Raven. She's been like the character on that team that everyone seems to like regardless of who you are. Seriously, you can't go to a comic book convention without seeing someone rocking a Raven cosplay. She's like the goth icon for superhero fans. Raven's super popular and it's kind of strange that DC hasn't done more with her. She's got an awesome but also absolutely terribly upsetting backstory, crazy strong powers that could literally destroy all we hold dear, and a personality that fans absolutely adore. Honestly, she could totally be DC's version of a much better and more interesting Scarlet Witch without any trouble. It's just frustrating that DC isn't giving her more love in the comics like they do in the shows. Number three, Aquaman. The ocean is a genuinely terrifying and interesting place. As such, the Atlanteans of DC Comics possess a few advantages over us regular humans. They have super strength, speed, endurance, and durability, all in order to help them survive the mind-boggling pressure at the insane depths of the ocean at which they live. But Aquaman himself is a royal Atlantean, which means that he is a super Atlantean. His strength and durability has allowed him to close the Marianas Trench, which I don't even know how that works, go toe-to-toe -to -toe with powerful foes like Martian Manhunter, Lobo, and Wonder Woman, and tank blasts from Starro. His speed, which is often forgotten about, allows him to swim at 10,000 feet per second, and he can move even faster without the pressure of water drag, allowing him to dodge bullets and catch lasers. 
But Aquaman has quite a few other advantages. His control over sea life has helped him in a large majority of his fights, with his underwater allies coming to his aid and helping him do things he probably couldn't do alone, like creating a massive tsunami with whales. His telepathic skill is actually quite impressive as well. Some of my favorite feats include him telepathically controlling a Green Lantern ring, reading the Martian Manhunter's mind without permission, and controlling a space dragon. For a while, he also had a hand that was a hook, and then that became a magical mystical water hand that could do a whole other level of feats, but I'm kind of out of time, so we're moving on. Number two, Animal Man. Thanks to an encounter with some rather strange aliens, Bernard Buddy Baker gained access to the morphogenic field, otherwise known as the red. This field basically allows Buddy to absorb and use different attributes of nearby animals while still being a human. So, he has been able to move his eyes independently like a chameleon, he's been able to ram against a speeding car with the abilities of a rhino, he can fly by tapping into birds, he's regenerated a whole lost limb by tapping into an earthworm, gained the strength to lift a car by tapping into a spider, and he's ran at 75 miles per hour by adopting the abilities of an ant. But his abilities have done some even more surprising things. Like for example, when a villain cut body off from the nearby animals by putting him in a room, he took on the attributes of the bacteria inside that villain's body, allowing Animal Man to duplicate himself. He can even tap into the attributes of extinct animals like dinosaurs, which has allowed him to punch out a T-Rex and survive being crashed into by a plane. Over time, he's received power boosts that allow him to use multiple abilities at once and then to even use the abilities of any animal in the universe, like when he used the power of a quote, sun eater, which let him fly across the galaxy in an instant. Number one, Icon. While Milestone's Dakotaverse isn't currently a part of the DC universe, the New 52 previously merged the universes together with the Wildstorm reality. Icon returned as the most powerful Milestone character in the new Earth M setting. He was originally an alien named Arnis, whose ship crashed on an Earth plantation. Arnis was raised as an unwilling servant named Augustus Freeman until his memories and powers developed during the Civil War. He spent 100 years working as a lawyer before Raquel Irvin convinced him to become the costumed hero Icon and set an example for others. Icon has incredible strength that rivals Superman's. Icon also has incredible reserves of energy that he can project in various forms. He's one of the best Superman-like characters and yet I feel like he just hasn't been given any real good times to shine recently. It's like DC kind of just forgot about him and a lot of the Dakotaverse alongside him. Number 10, Scarlet. When Jason Todd's Red Hood first returned from the dead, he was much more villainous than he has since become. Yes, he was a vigilante, but in the context of the stories he was appearing in, he was a Batman villain. In Battle for the Cowl, he even tried to murder both Tim Drake and Dick Grayson. After Dick Grayson became the new Batman while Bruce Wayne was dead, Jason created a more flamboyant Red Hood costume and even took on a sidekick to help him in his insane and murderous war on crime. Sasha, otherwise known as Scarlet. Sasha was the daughter of one of Professor Pig's henchmen, who tried to leave Gotham when things were getting too intense. Pig found out about this and decided to capture the man and his daughter and turn them into members of his Dolatron minions. This process involved disfiguring surgeries and brainwashing. Her father was converted, but Pig was stopped before the process could be completed on her. She smothered her father in prison and and was rescued by Jason, who took her on as his murderous sidekick. This career was short-lived, and she is not as effective as other sidekicks, however, she did manage to defeat and capture Damian Wayne through a strategic use of a taser and a knife. When Jason was defeated by Batman and Robin, Scarlet fled town, never to be seen again. Number 9, Harley Quinn. Harleen Quinzel was a psychiatrist at Arkham Asylum who fell in love with one of her patients. The Joker. He manipulated her into breaking him out of prison and joining him in a lifestyle of murder and mayhem. Harley meant nothing to the Joker, but he was able to use his manipulation skills to keep her around for years, being his most consistent and trusted assistant. She took on his clown gimmick as her own, through makeup or by a dip in a chemical bath, depending on the continuity. Despite being a psychiatrist, Harley is a skilled martial artist and acrobat, being able to defeat most of the foes she comes across with relative ease. She eventually realized 
realized how toxic her relationship with Joker was and went out on her own, eventually becoming more of an anti-hero at this point. Joker has since taken on a new protege, Punchline. But really, she's just a replacement Harley that DC created because they couldn't use Harley as a straight up villain anymore. So why talk about it? At number eight, we got Hercules. The Avengers have housed a plethora of gods, you guys. But you see, when people think about godly Avengers, usually it's Thor that hogs the spotlight. But hold on a second, because Hercules deserves some serious recognition too. He's got the strength, the charisma, and an impressive set of abs, yet he often plays second fiddle to the God of Thunder. Imagine being a god yourself and still living under someone else's shadow. Not cool, right? Like, even when you go into Herc's fandom wiki, his featured quote is literally a self-comparison to Thor about how whatever Thor can do, Hercules can do even muddier. It seems like no matter what, if Hercules is a part of the conversation, Thor has to be too. Or Maestro, I guess, but you get my point, right? Hercules deserves better. He's taken on cosmic threats, lifted entire mountains, and shown that he's more than just a pretty face. Let's give Herc some time to shine, Marvel. After all, the Avengers could use a bit more divine power in their ranks. At number seven is Loki. <laughs> Wait, what? Now, you might be thinking, why are you even considering Loki the literal antagonist of the first Avengers movie in a discussion about the Avengers? Well, it's because Loki is one of those characters who doesn't neatly fit into the good or bad box. He's kind of like that friend who's mostly a pain, but sometimes has moments of real kindness. When it comes to the Avengers, we often focus on the big names, but Loki's different. He's a trickster, a troublemaker, and he's caused his fair share of chaos, but deep down, there's a part of him that wants to do the right thing. And frankly, that's what makes his character so fascinating. So is Loki good or bad? Well, it's not that simple. See, people aren't just good or bad. They're a mix of both. And Loki here is no exception. He's made mistakes, but he's also shown that he can change and do the right thing when it counts. And so in the end, whether you think Loki deserves better or not, there's one thing for sure. He's a character who keeps us guessing, and that's what makes him one of the most intriguing Avengers of them all. And number six is Quicksilver, recommended by Nelson SC9 670 and Rodney Lindsay 849 again. Quicksilver bit the bullet way too early in the MCU. I mean, don't get me wrong, Wanda's cool and all with her reality bending powers, but her brother Pietro, aka Quicksilver, well, he definitely got the short end of the stick. See, he's got super speed, which is super awesome, but here's the deal. Quicksilver didn't get nearly enough screen time or development in the movies. I mean, sure, he had his moments, but they were just glimpses of what he could do. With a power like super speed, there's so much potential for epic action sequences. I mean, we've all seen the X-Men scenes. He could have been a real game changer in the MCU battles. Plus, he's also got that snarky attitude that could have added some humor to the team. So let's give Quicksilver the love he deserves and maybe, just maybe, if fans cry loud enough, maybe he'll get another shot in the MCU. Number five, Madison Jeffries. Another mutant member of Alpha Flight, Madison Jeffries served in the Vietnam War as a mechanic before returning home to Canada. He has the ability to alter and restructure inorganic materials with his mind. He uses this to create weapons and machines that help him in battle. When he returned home, he began suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder, which caused him to lose control of his powers and take over a small town. Wolverine was sent in to deal with the situation and helped Jeffries before he was recruited into the Alpha Flight training program, Gamma Flight. He eventually joined the main team, even having a relationship with Vindicator while her husband, Guardian, was presumed dead. Jeffries' powers extend beyond simply being able to control machines. He can actually phase his body and consciousness into machines, which he used on several occasions to merge with the box mech suit to heighten his strength in combat. Number four, Guardian. The leader of Alpha Flight, James McDonald Hudson, was a scientist working for the AmCam oil company to develop an exosuit to make oil exploration more efficient. When he discovered that AmCam was planning to sell the suit to the Americans to use as a weapon, he destroyed the prototype and went to work for the Canadian government, developing his super suit and going through various different hero names before settling on Guardian. His power suit acts as a powerful armor while providing him with force field protection. The armor also gives him the ability to fly and shoot concussive electromagnetic beams. Although he does not have super strength, he can use a graviton beam to lift heavy objects. He can also be propelled westward at the same speed as the rotation of the Earth, making him appear to teleport. When he was presumed dead, 
His wife, Heather, wore a similar suit, taking on the name Vindicator, leading the team in his absence. It was later revealed that Guardian had been rescued by the alien race, the Quirillin, who saved his life. They mistakenly thought the suit was part of him and turned him into a cyborg, making all of the suit's powers a part of him. Number three, Puck. In his original appearances, Eugene Judd was simply a little person who had incredible acrobatic abilities and fighting skills. When John Byrne left the series, it was revealed that he had actually once been an extremely large man who was attacked by an evil sorcerer. This resulted in him being given a lengthened lifespan, but losing his height as a result. Puck's compression grants him super strength, being able to lift 10 tons and move at superhuman speed. One of the most beloved members of Alpha Flight, Puck is considered the heart of the team. He was killed by the Collective, Puck was sent to Hell, where he fought his way all to the top, becoming the ruler of Hell for a time, before returning to life to help save the lives of his friends. Number two, Marina. Marina was found as an egg by the Smallwood family in Newfoundland, who raised the young alien as their own before she was recruited to train with Gamma Flight, eventually graduating to Alpha Flight in their first issue. She soon left the team to pursue a relationship with Namor the Submariner, who she eventually married. As an amphibian, Marina is able to thrive both above and below the water, being able to swim at a top speed of 51 knots. At times, her alien instincts would make her become bloodthirsty and violent, causing her hands to transform into deadly talons. Although not one of the most powerful members of the team, she eventually transformed into a leviathan, a giant sea snake that could shoot beams from her eyes. Number one, Shaman. Dr. Michael Two Young Men was Canada's most brilliant surgeon before losing his wife in surgery caused him to recommit his life to learning the mystic ways of his people. He eventually became Shaman, one of the original members of Alpha Flight. The source of his powers is a mystical pouch which contains anything he needs at any given time to perform his spells. He has been shown to be able to control plants as well as fire and the weather. He can also convene with spirits and animals, as well as project his astral form in a similar way as Doctor Strange. Shaman is incredibly smart, which makes him use these powers in really clever ways, making them even more effective. For example, when Guardian was almost murdered in X-Men Unlimited number 45, Shaman had the spirits of the air keep feeding air to the Guardian's brain so that they could preserve his brain functions until they could get him proper medical attention. Number 10, Catman. Catman is a hero who does not get enough love. He was originally a villain until Gail Simone flipped the script with his character, redeeming him by having him join the Secret Six. He'd later go on to become their leader. Catman was once the enemy of Batman. His power set currently is also connected to his kind of cat-like mantle, with him being believed to have nine lives and enhanced sense of smell at least in the Prime Earth continuity. Traditionally, some of his powers in the New Earth continuity were connected to his suit, but regardless, he has always been a gifted hunter, fighter, acrobat, and in that previous continuity was also considered a genius, which so many people in the DC Universe are. And friends, before we move on to this next spot, if you are loving what we do here at Top 10 Nerd, please, please, please go check out our newest channel, Most Amazing Top 10 Anime. Number 9, Ricochet. Ricochet is a really interesting hero. He's actually a mutant, but has also been spotted as a one-time member at the Avengers Academy. He also is a former member of the Slingers, which was where he was first introduced in their eponymous series in the 1990s. While the Slingers would later disband, they have since returned in the comics, with Ricochet being reunited with his former partner Dusk, who believed he was being held against his will when he simply had taken up a job with Beyond and was participating in experiments involving interdimensional tech. Ricochet's mutant power grants him enhanced agility and dexterity, which also lends to him having a power similar to to spider sense where he can basically feel when he's in danger and also makes him a skilled marksman as well. Number 8, Wildcat. You know Black Canary? You know Catwoman? You know Batman? You know Superman? Well then in a way, you know Wildcat. Ted Grant is Wildcat and he has trained all of those superheroes. If you've seen them go to blows with the villain, there's likely that you're seeing some of his skills on display there as a teacher and a boxer. Ted Grant was framed for the death of one of his opponents as a boxer years ago, and that's what has inspired him to become a fighter for justice, becoming a hero in his own right who served on the Justice Society of America. Number 7, Chi Demon. Just like Psycho, 
Empress Suyin King, or Chi Demon, was also a member of the new breed, although in my opinion she was just a bit more cooler. The reason I think that probably has a lot to do with the fact that she could summon an energy charged flaming sword using her molecular abilities. The only thing is that she was part of the new breed, and she was marginally less cool because she was part of that team. This means we don't get to see her do much, but she did get to beat up some bigots who attacked her in a parking lot for having progressive ideologies, so she gets a boost in coolness factor for that. Number 6, Pixie. Pixie was actually part of an Earth superhero team from the 20th century known as the First Line, a team who all completely perished except for Pixie when they defended Earth from a Skrull attack. Now, the fact that the team was decimated is pretty bad, but Pixie survived, which I feel kind of gives her at least a bit of a one up on others. As for her powers, well, she has all the eternal starter pack abilities, although when it comes to energy projection, she kind of sucks. But what's interesting about Pixie is that she carries a substance she calls her Pixie. Dust. This dust can turn creatures into stone for about an hour. Now, all Eternals have the power to transmute matter to a greater or lesser extent depending on how much they have developed it, so it's possible that Pixie uses the Pixie Dust as a focus for this side of her powers. Number 5, Interloper. Bedelak the Interloper is rather unique among the Eternals. While he is one of Earth's Eternals, he chooses to stay mostly separate from them. He doesn't even really deal with them at all except for the Eternal Gilgamesh, who also has a bit more of a solo thing going on, but we're going to talk about him in a sec. Other than the usual Eternal abilities, Interloper has a particular affinity for inducing fear in others. He can even do this to the degree that they will be too afraid to even face him, which is actually that's pretty intense. What's even more interesting about Interloper is that he seems to have a vendetta against the Dragon of the Moon. He he has faced this entity multiple times over his long life, even fighting it alongside King Arthur back in the day and alongside the defenders in more recent times. Number 4, Gilgamesh. Gilgamesh, or in his other names, the Forgotten One, Hero, or the Lost Eternal, is known to be one of the physically strongest of the Eternals. He is also a big fan of us, humans, and spent a lot of time traveling through the world, slaying monsters, hanging out with other heroes, and taking part in pretty big things. He's actually well known for being pals with Hercules as he helped him to clean the Aegean stables. He took on the burden of Atlas like Hercules did, and he and Hercules fought together on the walls at Urtatha and bested the demon dragon Zoo. Gilgamesh helped lay the foundations for Rome and even fought as a centurion for the Roman Empire. He befriended King David and helped translate the Rosetta Stone. It's for all his interference with humans that he was actually consigned to a forgotten part of Olympia by Zuras for a time. He's definitely one of the coolest Eternals out there even if he is kind of forgotten sometimes. Number 3, Ultimus. Okay, so just like the Earth has Eternals, so do a lot of other planets. One of those planets would be Hala, the homeworld of the Kree, resulting in the Kree Eternals and the Kree Deviants. One of the most well known of the Kree Eternals would be Ard Khan, or Ultimus. He, along with the rest of the Kree Eternals, took to space and went exploring, which brought them to Earth. But unlike the rest of his race, Ardkhan stayed here for about a millennia before being imprisoned by a deviant. When this guy first showed up in Thor issue 209, he was able to incapacitate Thor for about two hours with a single punch. So right off the bat, he's really strong. And going toe to toe with Thor shows us he has pretty much all the abilities Eternals have, like energy manipulation and being immune to any kind of aging, but Ultimus could also manipulate radioactive energy as well as using it to heal and strengthen himself as well as alter his size. He was also immune to the telepathic attacks of Star Fox, so he has that. Number 2, Falcon. When Zuras became the Eternal leader, he ordered the construction of Olympia, the Eternal's capital city, but there were also two other cities built as well, Oceania in the Pacific and Polaria in Siberia. Valken was a polar Eternal, and these Eternals were a bit more of a brutish group than it compared to the Olympia Eternals who were all fancy schmancy. But this group of Eternals also spawned some of the strongest ones including Icarus, Ajax, and Druig, who was the son of Valken. Valken's power should be evident from that fact alone, but his his presence scared a group of scuffling Eternals, including Icarus and the Delphin Brothers. He could fire energy from his eyes like Icarus, but also lightning bolt energy blasts from his hands. He could fly at the speed of sound, and he even had the telepathic ability to delete memories, even from Asgardians. But Valken's real strength probably lays in his mind. He was an incredibly gifted military strategist, as well as a really good architect. He was always said to be exceedingly intelligent, but he apparently lacked creativity 
Infinity, which probably led to his demise when Thanos became the Prime Eternal. Number one, Thane. Speaking of Thanos, Thane is another particularly unique Eternal. Thane is the son of the hybrid mutant Eternal. Thanos and an inhuman woman. So Thane is both an Eternal with that deviant gene, plus he was an inhuman, which is important as Thane underwent the process of terogenesis. And let me tell you, Buddy Boy here is pretty scary. After Black Bolt of the Inhumans detonated the Terrigen. During a fight with Thanos, who was looking for his lost son, the Terrigen Mists activated Thane's powers, which then accidentally decimated the inhabitants of the lost city of Orolon. Thane gained the ability of Death Touch with his left hand. This essentially meant that anyone within a certain radius of Thane just straight up meets their end. But it was an incredibly unstable ability to have, so he had to have a containment suit given to him by Ebony Ma. Now, with his right hand, Thane can project an amber construct, and anyone he traps within it is left in a state of living death. So it's either the end or like basically the end. Thane has used this ability when powered by the Black Vortex to contain the whole of the planet Spartax. Oh, he's also had the Phoenix Force at one point. It kind of feels like Marvel didn't really know what to do with this character, so they just kind of like threw different things at him. Number 10, Captain Marvel. In the comic book Avengers issue 197 published in 1980, Carol Danvers, who was then known as Miss Marvel, discovers that she is pregnant. However, she has no recollection of how it happened, and the baby grows at an alarming rate. Shortly after that, in Avengers issue 200, Carol gives birth to the baby, who also grows up at an alarming rate, and names himself Marcus. The Avengers seem excited about the birth, despite the bizarre circumstances of it, and Carol is made to feel like she is basically overreacting by not sharing in their enthusiasm and excitement for her. As Marcus grows, it is revealed that he is actually the son of Immortus, a ruler of Limbo. Limbo, not magic limbo, but a different limbo. Immortus, by the way, is one of the alternate timeline incarnations of Kang the Conqueror. Immortus had impregnated a woman he had plucked from time, Marcus's mother, and Marcus was trapped in limbo until he could be born on Earth. Marcus had basically brought Carol to limbo, specifically mentioning that she actually reminded him of his mother, a little weird, and used charm and his father's subtle manipulation devices and methods to impregnate her so that he could be born on Earth. Yikes. In the end, despite the large piles of red flags, many piles of red flags everywhere, Carol decides randomly that she actually feels empathy for Marcus, not knowing whether this is coming from herself or actually from his influence over her, and her friends and colleagues, her family, the Avengers, just basically smile and wave goodbye as she rides off into the sunset with the man who she is most definitely a victim of. Her lover turned son turned sort of love once more. Marcus Immortus. Oh boy. And friends, before we move on to our next spot on this list, if you love what we do here at Top 10 Nerd, and if you love when we talk about some of the more questionable things that have been done in comics, be sure to let us know by clicking that subscribe button. Number 9, Photon. While Monica Rambeau may finally be seeing some appreciation in the comics today, this wasn't always the case. I would say she started off with a bang in the comics, but then shortly after was kind of shafted multiple times over. Needless to say, she did recently get a five issue mini written by Eve Ewing. No relation to Al Ewing, by the way, which I am super excited to read, but I personally think Monica deserves a whole ongoing series all her own. That's how awesome and powerful she is. Number eight, Hawkeye. Hawkeye is often thought of as just being a guy with some arrows who is really good aim. Kinda is that. But the fact that he's one of the few human members of the Avengers who doesn't have any superpowers per se, other than maybe like really, really, really enhanced eyesight, but not super powered, just like abnormally good in ways that sometimes don't make sense, is exactly why he deserves more. More respect, more love, more admiration from us all. Hawkeye's Clint Barton doesn't have powers to rely on, and he still manages to keep up with the rest of his teammates. That's pretty awesome, I gotta say. I gotta say, I wasn't always a Clint fan, but I like Clint Barton, he's pretty cool. Number seven, Spider Woman. Spider Woman is another character who sometimes gets shafted in the comics, and she is a character who often gets compared to her seeming male counterpart, Spider-Man. Although truth be told, in canon continuity, Spider-Woman actually is older than Peter, and therefore in 
comic books history anyways, she was actually Spider Woman before Peter was Spider Man. She's canonically older so… I mean she has a kid and everything. Something Peter has never really even been allowed to do permanently as a character, settle down, have kids and grow up, all that good stuff. Although I would say that the fun of Jessica Drew is that she might be adulting really really hard, but she never really fully grows up. She's always fun, sassy and still figuring out so much of her life as she goes through it. To me she's always been not only fun and badass, but also a relatable character which is why I feel like she deserves to be featured more and get more respect from Marvel writers and fans alike, hence why she's on this list. Number 6. Black. Knight. Honestly, probably one of the most underappreciated heroes we have as leader of the Avengers is the Black Knight. That's right, he was a leader of the Avengers, everyone. The Black Knight is a character who feels like lately he has faded into obscurity somewhat. I thought maybe with Kit Harrington, made famous for his role as reluctant hero Jon Snow in the series Game of Thrones, playing Dane Whitman in the Eternals movie, we might actually see a resurgence of this character in the comics, and I was hyped for that, bolstered by his MCU appearance. However, while Dane Dane's role as the Black Knight was teased at at the end of the film with the appearance of his ancestral cursed sword, the Ebony Blade. We have yet to hear anything about the development of his announced series, and even Harrington himself says he's basically in the dark on what Marvel's plans might be involving this character. So it seems like we might have to wait a bit longer for Black Knight to get the respect he so deserves from modern day fans, but hopefully that's coming at some point soon. Like, come on, Marvel, give me the Black Knight series. Give me something. I want it. I feel like it could be cool and it would be very different. Number 5. Vision. Vision hasn't really had a major focus on him in some time. I love that he agreed to join up with Carol's Avengers and as such is getting more time on the Avengers team in the present day, where he can once more be in the spotlight. But I do feel like there was a little period in there where Vision wasn't really doing much of anything. Vision might seem like a boring character devoid of personality because he's an android, but I would argue that at times he is maybe more human than the rest of his teammates. There are moments in the comics where for me he reminds me of another android that I know and love, Data from Star Trek. Often it is his humanity that seems to motivate him and also seems to be something that Viz struggles with as well, both in realizing its existence within himself and in accepting that human part of himself. Like I mean you gotta realize it before you can accept it, but even when I feel like he is kinda like oh maybe that's what's going on, I feel like he's not willing to fully embrace his humanity. I know he's an android, but sometimes he's just some really human stuff guys. Number 4. She-Hulk She-Hulk recently just had her own solo series, which as far as I've read thus far is amazing by the way, I haven't finished it yet, but yeah. That series unfortunately just ended. And honestly, it bums me out. She-Hulk is Jennifer Walters, who contrary to some very loud opinions, is not just a gender swapped version of the Hulk. She is her own character in her own right, being Bruce Banner's cousin who he came to shortly after his transformation into the Hulk, kinda seeking some help from Jen. However, during his visit, Jen was attacked by criminals who were worried that she, as a lawyer, was going to take down their boss. A very real threat since since Jen is actually a pretty great criminal lawyer, or was so at the time anyways. Now she's more into superhero lawyering, but still. After this attack on her life and Bruce being forced into giving her an emergency blood transfusion to save it, Jen Walters was forever changed into the sometimes monster, mostly hero, She-Hulk. She-Hulk has had a tumultuous path throughout the comics, having her highs and her lows. She's had long runs and short runs, and I'm kind of disappointed she isn't doing more these days, especially considering she also just got her own Disney Plus plus series, so you'd think that would help to give her character a comic book boost, but not really apparently. Her recent series didn't even make it to 20 issues sadly, and like I said, it honestly was great. I'm not fully up to date, but trust me, the issues I've read are really really good, you should, you should check it out. It's like classic She-Hulk. It felt so like original She-Hulk times. Ugh, so good. Number 3. Captain Marvel I would argue that in a way, Carol is only recently starting to get her due. Captain Marvel has been and always will be one of the strongest Avengers around when it comes to the team. She is a cosmic powerhouse who has overcome a ton of adversity, but when it comes to her getting the respect that she deserves, she has had honestly a rough past. There was the whole thing with Marcus Amortis, see Avengers 197 through 200 for that fiasco, and then there was Civil Civil War 2, which saw Carol deal with some major character issues regarding how she was presented and written at that time. She became the villain of the story that should have honestly been equal in terms of which Avenger fans sided with, like in Civil War 1. However, that isn't how Civil War 2 went down. Lately, however, Captain Marvel is finally getting the respect she deserves as she has recently become the leader of the Avengers as we move into this new Avengers era. I am excited to see this kind of development happening for Carol, who has always been a strong and intelligent character who understands how to 
to best utilize and motivate a team. So see her in that leadership role, it's perfect for me. Number two, Blue Marvel. Blue Marvel has barely made any appearances recently in the comics, despite being one of the greatest powerhouses that we've ever seen. It's downright rude if you ask me. If I'm missing something amazing that happened with him lately as well, let me know. But I don't think he's really even been around since the end of the Defenders Beyond series. Before that, he appeared in Doctor Doom series, I believe. But my question is, when are we getting a Blue Marvel series? Huh? Marvel? Give us that Blue Marvel series right now, I want to read it. Well, Blue Marvel has not been a member of the main Avengers roster, which honestly also seems insane to me. He has been a member of the Mighty Avengers, which is why I'm including him on this list. And also because, come on, Marvel, give us a, give us a solo series, do it. Number one, Scarlet Witch. Only now is Scarlet Witch Wanda Maximoff starting to get the story she has so long deserved. For years, Scarlet Witch was epically burdened by her past and haunted by all of her misdeeds and mistakes she had made along the way. M Day has to have been one of the worst moments in mutant history, and it's all kind of because of Wanda. M Day happened in 2005 in the comics as a result of Scarlet Witch striking out at mutant kind after the events of House of M, where she attempted to create a reality where many heroes were happy. Fortunately, she she is now finally moving to a place of healing, refusing to be defined by her past while running a magic shop in Lotkill, New York, with the help of MCU's Darcy, appearing in the comics for the first time. Here, finally, Wanda refused to let her past define her present self. Yes. Finally, it's only taken us since 2005. It's taken so long to get to this point, but we're finally here. Ugh. Poor Wanda. Number 10, Hellstrom. Hellstrom is Damon Hellstrom, also sometimes going by the name Damon Hellstorm, the son of Satan. His initial appearance in Marvel Comics was shrouded in controversy due to him being marked as, well, you know, the son of the devil. But in recent years, this all died down with the ultimate dissolution of the Comic Code Authority, which made moral judgment calls on what subject matter could be covered or touched upon, even in comics, a lot less, uh, a lot less controversial, let's just say, for the most. Heart? Damon's father might not actually be the devil, as a few in Marvel Comics have made claims to this title. But either way, he still has become the ruler of at least a Hell Dimension, thanks to his birthright. While Damon is not known for appearing on the main Avengers team, he is known for being married to a fellow Avenger in the past, Hellcat, and has been a member of the Savage Avengers, which is why I'm counting him here. Although, lately, I feel like he's been a little less, little less hero-y in the comics. And friends, before I move on to our next spot on this list, if you love what we do here at Top 10, nerd, why not show us you love us by clicking that like button? Do it, it's good for you. You know what people say? An apple a day keeps a doctor away, a like a day keeps me at bay from telling you all of that all the time. Number 9, Hellcat. We don't talk about Patsy Walker Hellcat that often on Top 10 Nerd, but lately, I don't know, I've just been in kind of like a Hellcat kind of mood, I guess. Hellcat is definitely a hero who is overlooked on the Avengers roster, and honestly, her history has granted her some pretty unique and fun powers. I had fun looking back into Hellcat's past to be like, oh yeah, she has all these cool things. She has some magical abilities, including the ability to basically like dodge magic and see through illusions, making her hard to target for any magic users. She even can tap into a demonic side of herself, calling upon demonic energy to give her a boost in certain realms and in certain instances. It's conditional, but still it's pretty cool. Number 8, Big Barda. Big Barda is another hero who often feels invincible in terms of her approach to heroism. Big Barda herself is a new god. She hails from Apocalypse, where she was once one of Darkseid's fearsome female furies. Despite the fact that Big Barda has recently resurfaced joining up with the Birds of Prey, which honestly I think is a great fit for her, she hasn't been regularly featured prior to this for some time, and I feel like she is a character who deserves more hype in the comics. Heck, even in the movies, where is our Big Barda solo film, huh? I feel like actually James Gunn would probably do a really good job of putting that together, the Big Barda solo film. Oh, I would watch that. I would be in that. I don't, I don't know if I'm jacked enough to be Big Barda, but I'd get jacked to be Big Barda. She's so cool. Number seven, Naomi. Naomi is probably one of the most powerful of the newer heroes that we've seen. But do most people even know who she is? Probably not. Amber, do you know who she is, Naomi? Nope, see, there you go. Despite her powers being comparable, and I would argue even stronger than characters like Superman, she isn't often heavily featured in the comics. Unlike Superman, whose weakness is actually magic, Naomi bolsters magic around her. Haha! -ha. So magic does not have the same negative effect on her, but instead works almost in the exact opposite way. Her powers allow her to generate energy, which she can then use to boost her powers or any magic or magical beings around her. I'm still waiting for an epic Zatanna and Naomi team up to 
happened in the comics. And yes, I know Naomi had her own TV series, but she also only got one season of that. And while I've heard some great things about it, overall, it seems like the series was met with a mixed reception between audience and critics, so. Although honestly, I gotta watch it. I should watch the Naomi series. Bet I'd probably enjoy at least some of it. I mean, I'm surprised I'm enjoying Gotham Knights as much as I am, even though that show is a, an experience. Number six, Killer Frost. Caitlin Snow is truly a character that has sat on the periphery of the DC mainstream for years and years. Yet despite being super cool, pun intended, and interesting in regards to her backstory, whether we're focusing on Caitlin, honestly, or even her predecessor, Louise Lincoln, but especially Caitlin, she barely gets featured in the comics, appearing less than a hundred times in the last 10 years if we're talking about Caitlyn Snow, that is. And that's even with a version of Caitlyn's character being adapted for the CW Arrowverse television series, The Flash, appearing as one of the key members of The Flash's support team there. Number five, Batgirl. One of the weirdest things with DC is how sometimes they just completely leave their stories open to be in canon or not, depending on how fans receive those stories. And one of the weirdest incidents of this happening was actually with The Killing Joke. Now, The Killing Joke was written by Alan Moore and was never intended by him to be necessarily a part of the main continuity. And as far as I know, it still isn't even really fully canon, except for one part of that story, the successful attack on Barbara Gordon by the Joker, which left her both traumatized and paralyzed from the waist down. Why this was the only thing we chose to keep from this story, I don't know. But the whole idea of it just feels so super weird to me, especially when you consider how brutal and graphic this attack was against Barbara. And Barbara gets no opportunity to defend herself, having been surprised by the Joker's visit while visiting her dad in her civilian form. That being said, she's still Barbara Gordon, so you still would think, you know, maybe she maybe she'd do something, but no. This element of the story would change Barbara's life forever, and although I do like Babs as Oracle, it feels like she was robbed of some agency here. In fact, it feels like she was robbed of a lot of agency here, especially when you consider the story was never really intended to be incorporated into the canon. Barbara Gordon has since managed to heal and return to her role as Batgirl while still keeping all the skills she was shown to have as the brilliant hacker and computer whiz Oracle. But I still feel like the fact that she suffered so severely from what was intended to be a a story that existed outside of canon is brutal. Number four, Blackfire. You know you deserve better when I barely talked about you as a character on the channel, when I've been working here for almost five years. Yikes, poor Blackfire. I'm sorry, Blackfire. I'm sorry for my part in this. I feel like the thing I'd personally love to see more of from a character like Blackfire is perspective in the comics. Blackfire is the evil sister of Starfire. And I mean, she is really evil. And while she might be one of the best of the worst around, I would say she does ultimately lack some depth. Sure, she is really, really bad, but I've always found her to be more surface level in terms of her motivation behind why she does what she does. In the New Earth continuity, it's the lack of respect and love from her people and her jealousy for her young sister, Coriander Starfire, who got all that love instead that basically drives her to do such terrible things. In the Prime Earth continuity, this is less focused on, but still plays a role. And even in the New Earth continuity, I'd like to see more of this in terms of the nuances of Commander's character. I understand her being jealous, I, I get that, but how else does this affect the way the Blackfire sees not just like her sister, but like the whole world. How else does she justify such terrible actions? Is there any way to get across to her and potentially reach her on an emotional level? I want to feel for Commander, and I often feel she's robbed of any kind of sympathetic perspective, even with everything she went through as a child. I mean, like, I do feel bad for her in terms of like what happened to her, but I just feel like we never really get to connect with her, you know? And I, I think I'd like to do that more. Is that weird? People are gonna be like, why do you want to connect with this super evil character? Look, I just, I love evil characters and I think sometimes they have reasons. Number three, variant. Talk about women who have been shafted in the comics. How about any of the cyber women that we have seen who have acted as female counterparts to Cyborg? Among them is Variant. Variant only made a handful of appearances before she was tragically just like kind of written out, but I do think her character had promise and I've always felt it would be cool for Cyborg to have someone to talk to who really gets what it's like to live as he does and share his perspective. Scarlet Taylor is very similar to Cyborg in that regard, being a member of the CIA who almost lost her life on a mission and was saved by being transformed into a cyborg like, well, like Cyborg himself was. Number two, Vixen. 
Vixen is a supermodel turned businesswoman and in the current continuity, a supermodel slash fashion designer turned prime time show host and animal activist. Well, it's more than likely that Vixen has been an animal activist ever since she possessed the superpower to take various animal shapes. Armed with the Tantu Totem, she can transform into various different animals and harness their own unique abilities and powers. And even without the totem, she currently still can call on at least some of its power, giving herself like animal characteristics, basically. Still, despite having this insane amount of power at her fingertips and the fact that she has a pretty cool backstory is stunning, and as a badass, we don't see Vixen featured that often in the comics. When we talk about Halle Berry and DC, that Catwoman movie, look, that wasn't great, but I feel like Vixen would have been an amazing character to see Barry in the role of. Number one, Cersei. Well, Hecate and Hera are both goddesses. At one point, Cersei is even more powerful than the both of them. After she takes within herself all of Hecate's power, which allows her to tap into the source of magic. Even without being able to tap into the source of magic, Cersei is known for being a fearsome and powerful witch who can easily defeat many of those who would stand against her. And yet despite this, we haven't really seen Cersei focused on as a villain in what honestly feels to me like forever. I know it hasn't been that long, but it feels like forever. In Justice League Dark by James Tinney IV, we even get a great look into Cersei's tragic backstory that shows us why Cersei is as power hungry and ruthless as she is. She didn't necessarily have the easiest life, guys. It comes from a place of self-preservation because she was so cruelly mistreated by the world. And yet despite building up her character, it still often feels like she falls by the wayside at DC Comics. She's such a cool character. She should have her own series, honestly. Number 10, Batwoman. I love Batwoman, but I feel like so many times she honestly gets shafted, especially in regard to her connection to the Bat family. Granted, Kate Kane does often like to be independent from her cousin, Bruce Wayne, but she's still a member of the family, and I don't think she really gets featured enough in the comics. While she has been featured elsewhere in the DC Universe, she hasn't had her own self-titled series since 2018. And even then, that series only lasted for a year from 2018. 2017 to 2018, having just shy of 20 issues. You might think, wow, well, that's still a good accomplishment in modern day comics, and you're right. However, when you look at, you know, how long Batman always goes on for, we could have a little bit more Batwoman than, than like whatever she got, like 18, 19 issues. And friends, before I move on to our next spot on this list, if you love what we do here at Top 10 Nerd and you want more DC content from us, do I have good news for you? We have a DC Comics playlist, so go check that out. Number nine, Stargirl. Stargirl is one of those characters that I just feel we don't see enough of in the comics. Now she has had her moments in the comics and she did end up getting her own TV show, it is true. But considering that she did have her own TV series, I was kind of hoping we get to see more of her in the comics as a result. And in recent years, since her series started, this hasn't really been as much the case. Now she has been on the Justice League before, sure, and she's had her own mini series as recently as 2022, which is pretty good. But we still have never had an ongoing comic series for Stargirl. Like, She's never had a self-titled ongoing. And considering how cool Courtney Whitmore is and how much she is loved by the fans, it's honestly just kind of unfortunate. Number eight, Rogue. So I'm not going to lie, I actually love Rogue's weakness. Former weakness now, I guess. Rogue was one of my favorite characters growing up and I think what I loved about her so much was the tragedy of her story and her powers. But what's even more, I love the way that Rogue overcame them in the comics. Still, in overcoming her fears to gain full control over her powers, Rogue actually became kind of harder to write, I think. She's just honestly too powerful. This is why I feel like we don't get as many Rogue-focused stories these days in the comics. Sure, she and Gambit have their team up series going on, but I was really hoping for a rogue solo story during the days of Krakoa. Jonathan Hickman planned to write one, but ultimately decided against it when he agreed to hand over creative control to his X-Men team, as opposed to staying in charge of the main plot of the Krakoa era as the head of X-Desk. I still really want that Hickman rogue story, and I'm hoping that we get it, because yeah, I feel like there's so much more we could do with rogue in the comics. Number seven, Jean Grey. Despite being written as a powerhouse in the comics, Jean has a long history of weird choices being made for a character. And also initially she was basically just written to be a damsel in distress for a lot of the early days of the X-Men. She has constantly been killed off, in some cases to advance the story of her male heroic counterparts, whether that be motivating them to take some action or simply kind of freeing them from their romantic obligation to her. Number six, 
wasp, Janet Van Dyne. In the Ultimate Universe, Janet wasn't treated very well, but I'd also argue in the main continuity, Janet has had it, honestly, pretty rough. Initially, she was kind of like the sidekick to Ant-Man, and then it was revealed that he was not mentally stable, meaning that Janet, as his wife, had to put up with a lot, considering that Hank was later believed to be undiagnosed bipolar. Not blaming Hank for his own mental illness here, but just acknowledging that as a result, Janet had a lot that she had to live with as his partner and cope with. Eventually, the two do divorce, and then, from a hero's perspective, Janet kind of slowly starts to fade away as Hank becomes less and less relevant. Number 5. Iska the Unbeaten Iska is a super interesting character. On one hand, she's extremely powerful and can never lose. She can even potentially have her power utilized to manipulate the stakes of other competitions that she has pulled into herself. However, this also implies that there are times when she has zero control over her powers in the sense that she cannot influence the result of an unbalanced battle. In fact, her powers will pull her to serve the side that will be victorious, regardless of whether or not she wants to in terms of what her mind or her heart says to her. This means that Iska has been forced to turn her back on her own people, the mutants of Araco, more than once. She's also had to fight against her own family and colleagues before as a result. Although the one thing she can control at times is how she fights in a battle, which I think is interesting. Meaning if she has the option, she can basically try to fight others involved as opposed to those that she's close to. Despite the fact that she has done her best by choosing her opponents to help mitigate how she might be used to turn the tide in a battle, she still is sometimes painted unfairly, I would say, as a villain, when really she is a strong warrior who simply sometimes has no say in terms of her allegiances thanks to her powers. I really hope we get to see more of her and get to dive more into how being forced to turn on her allies at times has truly, probably deeply affected her. Number 4. Wasp, Nadia Van Dyne Janet even got replaced basically by her adoptive daughter, a younger version of the Wasp, Nadia Van Dyne, who was actually Hank's biological daughter from his previous marriage, who, well, he basically never knew existed. Nadia returned to the US after escaping the Russian Red Room, only to find out that Hank had actually died. She ended up bonding with Janet and ultimately taking up the Wasp mantle with her blessing, also taking her last name as well. I don't mind too much that Nadia is also now the Wasp. I just wish that Janet could also remain relevant while this was going on. In fact, despite Nadia also being a cool new character, I don't even think that she has stayed very relevant since her very recent introduction to the comic, which is unfortunate as well. Wasp is so cool, but yet we can't have any wasps that are super important lately. Number three, Madeline Pryor. I'm sure many of you at this point know how I feel about Maddie, but for those who don't, Madeline Pryor is basically the evil clone of Jean Grey, who initially wasn't evil at all. She's also been known before as the Goblin Queen. However, the fact that Maddie was always shafted and then eventually realized that the choices made in her life were manipulated and orchestrated into happening by Mr. Sinister prompted her to basically have a mental breakdown, honestly pretty reasonable, and turn on those who she had once called her allies and friends. That's when she ends up becoming the Goblin Queen. Number 2. Scarlet Witch M-Day has to have been one of the worst moments in mutant history. M-Day happened in 2005 in the comics as a result of Scarlet Witch striking out at mutant kind after the events of House of M, where she attempted to create a reality where many heroes were happy, but after learning of its falseness, was once again rejected by all those she had actually tried to help here. Pretty devastating, especially when, while Wanda was warping reality here, she was doing so in an effort to not only defend herself, but also make herself and all of her friends happy. In fact, I would argue her friends and teammates, the Avengers, were somewhat and in fact, I would say just full on complicit in what happened, since they never really reached out to Wanda to try and help her when she was struggling emotionally, prompting her to warp reality, which ultimately led to her wiping out almost all mutants during M Day. And if you don't believe me that that is the case, I mean, there's literally an alternate reality where if Jessica Jones was there, pretty much none of this would have happened. So, yeah. M Day happened mainly because Wanda was striking out at her believed to be father at the time, Magneto, who she claimed loved mutant kind more than he did his own family. Wanda said, the words, no more mutants, and with that small utterance, depowered or destroyed millions of mutants the world over. An action that would cement her as one of the greatest mutant villains in the comics for years beyond, despite her long-standing history before this, working as a hero. Number 1. Wasp 
ultimate. Oh boy, probably the worst, the worst one, I would say. <laughs> Pretty bad. Janet Van Dyne's death in the Ultimate Universe has to be, honestly, one of the worst things. First of all, we don't even show her enough respect to give her an on-panel death, as she drowns during the tidal wave in Ultimatum, one of the many poor victims who perished off-panel, despite, like many others, deserving an on-panel death. But really, when we're talking about those that deserved an on-panel death, Jan is really top tier. She's really high up there, especially considering Considering Janet was actually the leader of the Ultimates at this point. So not only are we off to a bad start here, but then she also gets eaten by the Blob for some reason. It's also weird that they decided to make the Blob do this. I know he's a bad guy, I know he's a villain, but he isn't typically known to like be a can anywhere else in the Marvel multiverse pretty much ever. The Ultimate Universe had a weird and unhealthy obsession with can initially. At least, it felt like. And for this list, starting off at number 10 is Magneto. Starting off this list with the absolute goat. Magneto has been around for a long time, and a majority of that time, he was a villain, or at best, an anti-hero. As the number one rival of Professor Charles Xavier, Magneto's view of the world is Pretty interesting given that he was the child of a Jewish family during World War II. And yet, after years of persecution for being a mutant, he believed his race to be superior to regular humans nonetheless, and that humans should be subservient or destroyed. Under this mentality, he led the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants as well as other groups against the X-Men and the Earth's heroes. Now everybody knows that Magneto is not someone you mess with. He has enough power and enough experience to stomp almost anyone. For example, while he has become more of just a hero nowadays, there's a point where he gets his heart ripped out by a villain called Uranus. But he keeps himself alive by using his powers to keep his blood flowing. He's just that insanely powerful. But being born around World War II and the rival to Charles Xavier, he's been up there in the age department since he was introduced, but always manages to decimate his enemies. Number 9, Cassandra Nova. Sticking with X-related heroes, we have the evil twin, or or counterpart or anti-self to Charles Xavier. Cassandra Nova isn't really a mutant, but she isn't really a person either. She's actually what is known as a mummadry, the spirit that is equal to the opposite of a person. Wrap your head around that one. This is about to get wild, so buckle up. Because of the genetic mutant potential of Charles Xavier, his mummadry was able to create a physical form for itself when Sharon Xavier was pregnant with Charles, making Cassandra basically Xavier's twin. Now Charles, even as a baby sensed Cassandra as an evil presence and he used his psychic abilities to try and take her out in the womb. Cassandra survived though and so she spent decades as this terrifying mass of cells in a sewer, building herself a new body and planning her revenge on her brother. Cassandra has all the same telepathic powers as Charles himself, plus some telekinetic abilities as well. But being a mummadry, she has the terrifying ability to manipulate DNA, breaking it down, copying it, and being able to construct physical bodies. She can even phase through solid objects, regenerate insanely fast, and enhance and evolve other mutant abilities. Number eight, Tal Talia al Ghul. Daughter of the infamous League of Assassins leader Ra's al Ghul, Talia witnessed the death of her mother and was put in the care of her father. Together they traveled the world and Talia was trained by her father to emulate his skills and intellect. She eventually fell in love with Batman, and Ra's orchestrated a false abduction of her and Robin in order to test Batman's skills and see if he would be a suitable heir. Batman of course refused to join forces with Ra's despite his feelings for Talia. Talia eventually became the heir and would go on to become the leader of the League of Assassins whenever Raish is dead. Her and her father have a tense relationship due to her conflicting allegiances and his willingness to sacrifice her for the greater good if needed. She is the mother of Damian Wayne, Batman's biological son and the current Robin. Speaking of which, number 7, Injustice Nightwing. In the Injustice universe, Superman snaps and becomes a real dick. Tater. He decides that criminals cannot be allowed to live and sets about exterminating them. When he gets to Arkham Asylum to end the lives of its inmates, Superman is confronted by Batman, Damien's Robin, and Dick Grayson's Nightwing. Damien has always been the most bloodthirsty of the Robins since he was raised by assassins, and he actually has a higher body count than even the Red Hood. So perhaps it shouldn't be too surprising that he actually agreed with Superman that the criminals should be destroyed. This led to an argument with Nightwing that resulted in Damien throwing one of Nightwing's 
Nightwing's weapons at him. Damien expected him to dodge, but Dick was distracted because of the massive prison break that was happening, and it hit him in the head. He fell to the ground and broke his neck. Batman blamed Damien for Dick's death, you know, because it was entirely his fault, and this led to their relationship becoming damaged to the point of no return, and Damien was taken under Superman's wing, and he eventually took up his fallen brother's mantle as the new Nightwing. This Damien considers Superman more of a father than Bruce ever was, but this is actually just a manipulation on Superman's part to get an ally who is well suited for helping him take out Batman. This is evidenced by how Superman sent the mass murderer Victor Zaz after Alfred, knowing that Batman's refusal to kill Zaz even after the death of Alfred would destroy any chance they had of fixing their relationship and solidify Damien's loyalty to him. Number 6. Karai Last time I talked about the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, I got their names and weapons mixed up, because honestly, I never got into them as a kid, since, you know, the cartoon stopped airing when I was two. So I'll have to be careful with this one. Karai in the original comics is a agent of the foot who comes to New York after the death of the Shredder and sort of takes things over. When the 2003 animated series, which I also never watched because I was strictly a Batman kid growing up, when that series came out, Karai was given more backstory. The audience learned that she was Shredder's adopted daughter who he had taken in and raised after she was abandoned by her parents. He trained her in ninjutsu and she became his most trusted follower, eventually being put in charge of the Japanese Foot Clan. In her appearances in other media in the years since, this new backstory is sometimes adopted, but it's interesting that her status as Shredder's sidekick or co-worker really just depends on which version you're exposed to. In the 2012 animated series, she can also spit venom and transform into a snake girl, so I don't know, that's kind of fun. Number 5. Decimus Furious Decimus Furious actually began his life all the way back in ancient Rome, where his mother and father took their own lives, leaving Decimus homeless on the streets. In 281 AD, on the cusp of the afterlife due to his hunger, his mutant powers activated. This gave him super strength and durability, alongside an extremely bestial form similar to like a minotaur, but almost as if it was made of stone. He's really super cool looking, honestly. But his more powerful ability would be empathic war infection. This basically means that Decimus can infect anyone who he strikes with a thirst for war, which will send them into a rage filled state. It also acts as a defensive tool against telepaths who try to read or control his mind, causing the war infection to overcome the telepath. He has also been shown to be able to piece himself back together after being blown up, which is funny because he blew up when Phantom X made him feel love, which did not compute and he just went boom. He became Apocalypse's final horseman of war. Number 4. War Path James Proudstar is the younger brother of John Proudstar, also known as Thunderbird. And he always idolized his brother, but in that idolization, he actually limited his own powers to a degree. Mostly, his mutation boosts up his physical capabilities, granting him super strength that has had various different levels. Once having Hulk levels of strength, but another time struggling to fight an alligator. He can run at 100 miles per hour, and his stamina allows him to exert himself for 24 hours without rest. He can withstand a hell of a lot more than a regular human, like falling several stories or being hit with energy. Blasts. His agility and reflexes are increased to the point of dodging bullets, and his senses allow him to see in the dark and hear sounds other humans can't. After some training with Pete Wisdom, Warpath has shown the ability of self propelled flight and a regenerative healing factor. What's really interesting is that while working with Ghost Rider, James gains shamanistic abilities like perceiving spirit energy. He's also probably one of the best mutant combatants, whether it's unarmed or armed, with his vibranium daggers. Number three. Gideon. I believe Gideon here is the first external to make this list. The externals include immortal mutants like Selene and Apocalypse, but they all share a psychic link which separates them from other immortal characters. Gideon was born during the 15th century and aboard Christopher Columbus's first expedition, he actually succumbed to scurvy and his life was changed forever when he resurrected and gained his mutant abilities. Like all externals, Gideon is immortal and no longer ages. He can also resurrect himself, as confusing as that sounds since he's immortal. But unique to him is the ability of power mimicry, giving himself the powers, advanced skills, and talents of any being 
android or even battle suit. And he's been able to gain the powers of three people at once. But more than that, his powers allow him to fully understand how to use that other person's powers to the point that he can even overcome the original user of said power. Number two, Cypher. Cypher, or Doug Ramsey, has omnilingual translation abilities. And considering that communication is an essential part of our everyday lives, whether that be with other humans, devices, or even our own selves, I'd say he's pretty powerful. He can translate language of literally any origin, even alien. He can read and decipher codes, including computer code, as well as read body language, subtext, and unspoken intention. More recently, everything he sees is interpreted as information, meaning he basically kind of just reads life. He can read body language to the extent he's able to predict people's moves before they make them. He can learn and perform spells from magic users, and he even created his own overly complex language that makes him immune to psychic mind reading. But Doug actually merged with Warlock, essentially giving Doug techno-organic shape-shifting abilities on top of everything else. And for our number one spot, we are going to talk about my number one favorite X-Men, Nightcrawler. Kurt Wagner was first introduced in Giant Size X-Men number one in April 1975, with the mutant ability to biophysically displace himself into the brimstone dimension, travel through through it with a subconscious sense and then return back to our dimension in a different location, essentially teleporting. This all happens so fast it's almost instant and it always is accompanied by the signature BAMF sound. Although he can teleport really really far, even across the world more recently, he avoids teleporting to places he hasn't been before or places he can't see as he can accidentally end up appearing within solid matter which could potentially end his life. Although he does have a small amount of spatial awareness that at least keeps his feet from teleporting into the ground and he can even use the little demon things known as BAMPs as teleportation beacons that allow for teleportation to places he hasn't been before, even across dimensions. Through his unique physiology, he gains a few extra abilities as well, like a prehensile tail, micro suction hands and feet, and flexible bone structure, but he can also camouflage himself, bending light using the brimstone dimension. But what a few might not know is that he actually became immortal thanks to the fact that recently, he sacrificed his soul in heaven to come back to life, which is good because I never want to lose this legendary blue mutant. Number 10, Brainiac. When it comes to Brainiac, I always think of that time that he was defeated by Superman. When Superman kicked him out of his own ship onto Earth and Brainiac was defeated by the germs of Earth. Oh boy. But just because that is one of the first thoughts that comes to my mind when I think Brainiac, doesn't mean that it defines the character as a weakling. Actually, not at all really. There is definitely something to be said for having a jacked brain. And Brainiac has also been depicted as having a jacked bod before as well. Like that time in Jeff John's action comic story arc, Brainiac, a five part story story where it was revealed that all of the Brainiacs Superman had fought in the past were merely androids and that the real Brainiac was even more powerful than all of them combined, both mentally and physically. And friends, before we move on to this next spot, if you love what we do here at Top 10 Nerd and you've thought to yourself, man, I wish they talked about anime, man, I wish they talked about manga, guess what? We do! You can check it out at Most Amazing Top 10 Anime. Go give them a sub and let them know I sent ya. Number 9, Black Hand. Black Hand is William Hand, the Herald of Necron. In the Prime Earth continuity, he becomes a Black Lantern again who earns his ring after taking his own life, rather than remain as an indigo lantern. When the opportunity presents itself, he seeks freedom, taking his own life so that he might rise again as a black lantern. After dying, he was resurrected, being offered his own black lantern ring, which emerged from his mouth. As a black lantern, Black Hand has the power to control dead bodies. He can temporarily revive and animate them, although these people are not really brought back to the living, but more become like thralls under his control or zombies. As a member of the undead as well, Black Hand is almost unkillable. He can regenerate from almost any damage done to him, including having his brain completely fried by Hal Jordan. In the Prime Earth continuity, William Hand was one of the members of the Legion of Doom for a short time. Number 8, Killer Frost, number 2. <laughs> Killer Frost the second is Dr. Louise Lincoln in the New Earth continuity. 
continuity, she was the legacy villain who followed in the footsteps of her former colleague, Crystal Frost, the former Killer Frost, who was also a supervillain, like Louise would become. After Crystal died, Louise thought the best way to honor Frost was to repeat the experiment that basically turned Frost into a heat vampire. Seems like a weird way to honor your former colleague. I mean, could have just written, you know, a nice poem or something. But hey, the experiment, of course, resulted in Lincoln gaining the same powers, turning her into the new Killer Frost. She can, in essence, freeze her surroundings, eliciting cold wind gusts as well, emanating extremely cold temperatures. And she feeds on heat, which usually cannot harm her, but instead fuels her cold based powers. Number seven, Empath. Empath, while downplayed somewhat in the current series, has to be one of the most powerful characters to have joined the Hellions team. Actually, I feel like he was downplayed because he's so powerful, because I don't know, you have a character this powerful and then have people get stuck in scenarios. He's actually a member of the original Hellions team as well as the new Hellions, which were reformed at the behest of Mr. Sinister under the leadership of Psylocke. But he was also acting as a spy for the initial woman behind the Hellions, the original Hellions, Emma Frost. Empath is Manuel De La Rocha, and despite meeting many untimely ends during his time working on Sinister's Hellions, Empath is extremely powerful as he has the power, in essence, to manipulate and control others' emotions. Empath can also read emotions, being as his name implies, an empath. He can change the level or type of influence he has over another person, turning them into a mindless zombie following his orders without question, a lovesick puppy, something more nuanced, or something in between any of these states of control. Empath can also exert his influence over more than one person at a time. Number 6. Firestar Firestar is Angelica Jones. She was once a Hellion recruited by Emma Frost and later manipulated by her as well during her time on the team. Pretty disappointing for Angelica to find out later, she greatly looked up to Emma at one point. Firestar has since proved her metal enough to make the cut for the current X-Men team. Firestar's powers harness microwaves, which she can then emit in a fiery blast or use to cause her target to heat up and even melt because microwaves. Firestar has also managed to use her powers in the past to disrupt psionic abilities. I also feel like microwaves don't sound that impressive, but when you think about it, microwaves are a pretty powerful thing to control. Number 5. Havoc Often seeming to rank lower when it comes to polls for everyone's favorite Summers brother, Havoc is still a powerful hero and a super interesting character. Honestly, he does not get enough love. Ever the middle child, the amount of struggle and misfortune Alex Summers has seen in his life is pretty unprecedented. He never really wanted to become an X-Men, but ultimately resided to doing so because he found being in mortal peril seemed to have become something inescapable for him anyways in his daily life. I guess at that point you're kind of like, ah, oh, right, fine, I guess I may as well become an X-Men. I'm already kind of in the whole scene anyways and I can't seem to get out of it. Havoc was a member of the newest Hellions team that appeared in the eponymous series from 2020. Havoc emits plasma bursts which radiate from him in circular waves from all around his body. He sometimes struggles to control his powers which is why he can be seen as a danger or a loose cannon. Or maybe you know, not everybody's favorite because he's not as predictable. His plasma bursts come from cosmic energies that he can draw on and is pretty much always passively absorbing. Number 4. Quanin, aka Psylocke, as she is simply known now. The only reason I'm ranking Psylocke a little lower on this list is because many of us do know how powerful she is, but there are some out there who may be less inclined to be a fan of Psylocke now due to the fact that she's 100% physically and mentally Quanin, with zero trace of Betsy Braddock attached to the character anymore. I personally am super here for this change, let Betsy do her own thing, and let Quanin keep the mantle of Psylocke. I think that makes sense, especially after everything she's been through, it seems fair, and it's not even really all she's due as a character in my opinion, because Quanin, yeah, she she got pretty messed up really for a while there. There's a lot more that she's owed as I see it. Psylocke was the leader of the newest Hellions team who were brought together by Mr. Sinister. And now she's over on the Marauders, but she's still kicking butt over there. Number three, Mr. Sinister. While Mr. Sinister is an amazing weirdo of a character that I simply think many people I guess don't think of much at all. He is definitely someone to be considered. Not just for the fact that he is a deeply interesting and fashionable character in the comics, but also because he is immensely powerful when it comes to his intellect, his cunning, and at times, his abilities, depending on which era of Sinister we're talking about. The really interesting thing about Sinister is that although he is a major mutant and X-Men villain who possesses powers, he's not technically a mutant. Well, he is. 
and he isn't. The only reason he is allowed to be on Krakoa is because Sinister was decided to be basically mutant enough to gain an invitation to join the mutant nation. Nathaniel Essex was not born a mutant, but gained powers from Apocalypse, who altered him with celestial tech on a genetic level to give him powers and in essence evolve him. From there, Sinister would actually experiment on himself, using mutant genes to turn himself into a mutant by force. No wonder Deadpool is so sad about not getting invited to Krakoa. I mean, if Sinister qualifies, I feel like we have to let people like Wade and the until recently banned and dead Madeline Pryor join the party as well. I mean, just seems silly. Seems silly that Maddie was actually banned for so long just because she was a clone. Sinister not only possesses a genius level intellect, but is also immortal and a skilled psionic both in telepathy and telekinesis. He also has super strength, speed, dexterity, and endurance as well. And at one point, he displayed teleportation abilities, although it was never really fully clarified as to if this was like tech or like an actual power that he possesses. So I'm not really sure where we are with the teleportation stuff. I think he's not a teleporter though. I haven't seen him teleport in a while, unless he's doing it when I'm not looking. Number two, Cypher. Lately, Cypher has been having the time of his life on Krakoa. His power is that he can speak, communicate, and understand all languages as a mutant. In the past, he was often dunked on because of this, with his power set being seen as weak and, you know, not super useful. Sure, he could help break down communication barriers, but how useful is that in a fight where everyone can speak the same language? Over the years, we've seen Cypher's powers expanded upon and more broadly oddly defined to include all forms of communication. Cypher can now also talk to computers as such, and even has been shown as a skilled fighter due to fighting being like a physical language that he can understand, read, and also speak physically. However, this element of his power was seemingly kind of forgotten during the other world tournament, where he was one of Krakoa's champions, shown to be uh, struggling a bit. He actually needed some help from Magic, and Magic was like, oh boy, oh, oh Doug. You're struggling. On Krakoa, he's the only one who can communicate with the island nation, which also makes him extremely valuable and powerful. Number one, Orphan Maker. Orphan Maker's full name has never been revealed, and I don't think we've ever gotten a face reveal of this character either, at least not as far as I can remember. We simply know his first name. Peter. He is a mutant who typically walks hand in hand with Nanny, who acts as his caretaker and sometimes his wrangler. While having the mental state of a child, despite being seemingly a fully grown man, Orphan Maker has been shown to be pretty powerful when it comes to his fighting capability. To this day, we don't know his true mutant power, but it has been alluded to that his powers are great. In fact, that is apparently why he wears a suit, to contain his powers, and why after being resurrected on Krakoa, his X gene was not activated. It's been said that his powers are like earth shattering. That's how powerful he is. Number 10. Artie. Arthur Artie Maddox is an interesting one. His mutant abilities manifested when he was just 11 years old, leaving him disfigured and mute, but granting him the very interesting ability of visual telepathy. This means that Artie can connect to his or others thoughts, and he can project those thoughts as psionic holograms or pictograms. This is really useful for Artie, specifically as he is a mute, but at the same time, I gotta say I think that regular telepathy would kind of be a bit more useful, and I don't know. Doesn't matter because Artie's power is more cool because he can even make large scale holograms and use them in battle, usually for defense. But Artie can also perform something called a mind lock that allows him to paralyze someone physically or mentally. I kind of hope he keeps evolving his powers, but we'll see. Number nine, I scream. I scream, that's I like this, or scream like is a villain of the X-Men who decided he needed to destroy the X-Men using their danger room. He actually got pretty far in that plan too, and he was able to overload Cerebro, taking down Professor X temporarily. Now I'm going to assume he did that by giving the device a brain freeze, because if you hadn't guessed, Ice Cream can turn into any flavor of ice cream. And then everyone screams for Ice Cream's ice cream. No, that's not true, sorry. But using his abilities, he was able to enter the X-Men's mansion and the danger room before Xavier came back to and lowered the temperature in there, freezing Ice Cream's ice cream form, which is when a clown turned him into a banana split and split from the scene. Just go read Anoxio the Clown from 1983, you'll get it. Make sure you guys check out the other videos in this series and drop a like on this video to show us your support. Number eight, Peeper. 
Peeper, or Peter Quinn, first appeared in Captain America Annual No. 4 in May 1977 as part of Magneto's new Brotherhood. A brotherhood of verbally based villains. Slither, Shocker, Lifter, Burner, and Peeper. Seems like a bit of lazy writing over at Marvel to me, but mm. This group actually went under a couple different names under a couple different leaders, including Mandrill and the Red Skull. Peeper, though, is definitely the most interesting of the bunch, and he's also more relevant as he has appeared recently as part of Abigail Brand's sub team called the Six. On this team, Peeper played the role of the Eye, using his abilities to examine Kyrbon or Kerbon particles. That's because Peeper has the gift of telescopic, microscopic, and X ray vision using his enlarged eyes. But he also had an offensive ability in the form of yellow or red concussive optic blasts. He also seems like a decent dude, despite usually being a villain. Number seven, Cheetah. Cheetah is someone we maybe don't think of as being super powerful in the DC universe, but we also need to keep in mind that she is a villain strong enough to take on the likes of one of the Justice League's founding members and members of the holy trinity there, Wonder Woman. Cheetah, like many supervillains on this list that you might underestimate, is also a genius and was actually handpicked to be a member of Lex Luthor's Legion of Doom when he reformed the team during Rebirth. For a time, she even wielded the reforged God Killer sword in addition to her cheetah like and magic based abilities and powers. Although Barbara Minerva has since given up the blade, returning it to the Amazons. Number six, Black Adam. Black Adam has to be one of the most powerful members of the Legion of Doom. He is magic based when it comes to his powers and packs enough of a punch to rival Shazam and, in some instances, also Superman. In fact, because he is magic based, he sometimes even gets a leg up on fights with Superman. Black Adam has been allied before with the Legion of Doom when he was. Is a formidable and terrifying foe to come across, but he's also been a powerful ally to the Justice League before. In fact, up until recently, he was a prominent member for the Justice League, but Dark Crisis may have caused his allegiances to turn. Which makes sense. Something as apocalyptic as Dark Crisis may just require, you know, a darker approach that only the Legion of Doom would be willing to take. Unfortunately, I don't think it panned out too well for them either, but you know, they try. They're doing their best. Black Adam is ranked a little bit lower on this list, by the way, because we already kind of know, you know, he's super strong, but there are some people that don't think about him, so I still wanted to feature him here. Number five, Golden Glider. Golden Glider is Lisa Snart, sister to Captain Cold's Leonard Snart, and longtime girlfriend of another fellow rogues member, Mirror Master. Golden Glider is a pretty cool and underrated character, I think. She never wanted superpowers in the Prime Earth continuity version of her story, but hey, she got them anyway. This happened when the rogues attempted to merge their weapons with their DNA to basically grant them actual superpowers. The device they were using exploded, and Lisa was caught in that explosion, leaving her physical body comatose, but granting her astral projection powers, which she could use to phase and turn invisible. Number four, Bizarro. While maybe not the most intelligent traditionally of the lot, Bizarro is still a very powerful foe who deserves his place on this list. Bizarro is basically seen as being the reverse of Superman. For example, while Superman is good and has heat vision, Bizarro is generally bad, a villain, with his own equally powerful cold vision. Depending on the origin and which Bizarro we're talking about, Bizarro is an imperfect clone of Superman created by Lex Luthor. At one point in the Prime Earth continuity, he also possesses a genius level intellect, which made him even more dangerous, but alas, this was only temporary. Poor Bizarro. Number three, Heat Wave. Wherever Mick Rory goes, fire generally follows. Mick Rory is Heat Wave, a pyromaniac who also happens to be a genius. A deadly combination. His origin story in the New Earth continuity involved him pretty much killing anyone who ever managed to get close to him as he was growing up by setting them aflame. See what I mean? Flames are literally following him everywhere. Although Mick, of course, was always the person responsible for those flames. When he was just a kid, he set fire to his own family home and was so fascinated by the sight of the flames that instead of running for help, he just watched the house burn. His entire family died in the fire. As Heat Wave, Mick has been a member of the Rogues, as well as the Legion of Doom, and is known for building his own heat gun. He also created a substance known as Ultra Steam that was powerful enough to even set fire to the Flash at a cellular level. Number two, Captain Cold. Captain Cold may sound ridiculous, but he was one of the prominent members of the Legion of Doom way back in its early days. The Legion of Doom actually first appeared not in the comics, but in the anime 
animated 1976 cartoon, Challenge of the Super Friends. Here, Captain Cold was one of the members featured and acted as an antithesis to the superhero The Flash. Captain Cold is Leonard Snart, and pretty much has always been Leonard Snart, since way back when, during his first appearance, which was in the comics in 1957's Showcase Number 8. Captain Cold is so deadly because of his brilliant mind. He is a master engineer, and back in the New Earth continuity, he even made his own cold gun. But in the Prime Earth continuity, despite not making that tech and stealing it, he's still a genius and knows his cold gun inside and out due to taking it apart and putting it back together multiple times to ensure he fully understands every single piece of it. Leonard Snart is severely underrated as a foe, in my opinion. Number 1. Black Manta Black Manta is definitely a character you could easily underestimate. He is often driven by one purpose, to kill Aquaman. But his drive often knows no limits, and he's not even Atlantean, he's just a guy with a sub in a fancy scuba suit. He's been a member of the Legion of the Doom before, but he was recently pulled back to the Legion after learning during Dark Crisis that Aquaman had died. This evidently defeats a good deal of Manta's purpose in terms of you know why he's underwater, why he's around Atlantis, although he had just promised Jackson, his son, he'd always be there for him. Ugh. Black Manta did decide to end up leaving though to serve a greater purpose with the Legion of Doom, which was reformed to fight against those infected by the Dark Crisis. Number 10. Grey Crow Grey Crow has probably been one of my favorite character evolutions in the comics. Originally, John Grey Crow was a villain, one of Sinister's marauders, and was known by a codename so awful I cannot really speak it here. But you can look it up if you feel so inclined to see for yourself. However, he recently turned over a new leaf on Krakoa, finding camaraderie with the misfit team known as the Hellions, brought into existence at the suggestion of Mr. Sinister, but led by Psylocke, and co-led really by John himself, who acted as Quanin's right hand man. Grey Crow Crow's powers allow him to manipulate mechanics, which is generally why he himself often chooses to be covered in tech. And in fact, for a while, I thought he was a cyborg, but he's not. He's just a guy covered in tech. And friends, before we move on to this next spot on our list, if you are loving what we do here at Top 10 Nerd, please, please, please go check out our newest channel, Most Amazing Top 10 Anime. Number 9. Beef Beef was added to Emma Frost Hellions team to be their new muscle after the loss of the second Thunderbird, James Proud, now known as Warpath. Beef is Buford Wilson. Of course, of course, of course his name is Buford. Of course it is. His mutant powers allowed him to increase his strength and his size. In increasing his size, his strength and endurance would also increase as well. We haven't really got to know Beef super well, so the limits for his power set are as of yet unknown, but he was able to get on the level of strength to rival Namorita, although he did inevitably lose to her during the Hellions battle with the New Warriors, which was way back when. Then he died for a bit, but now he's back. Beef. Number 8. Magma Magma is Amara Akia. She was once a member of the New Mutants, who were known to be rivals of the Hellions team, but Amara developed an attraction for a member of the Hellions, Empath, which would later be revealed to be a mutual attraction between the two. Eventually, Magma would even leave the New Mutants and end up deciding to join the Hellions instead. Magma is pretty powerful despite the fact that she doesn't get a ton of love usually in the comics. She can move tectonic plates, causing short ranges of earthquakes, create lava, or of course, magma, and manipulate and generate generate fire. Number 7. Brew. Saying that a mutant is unique kind of feels redundant, as most mutants have pretty unique abilities from others of their kind. But Brew is even more unique, as he is not a mutant of the human race. Instead, Brew is a mutant of the incredibly violent and parasitic insectoid alien race known as the Brood. This essentially means he can actually feel compassion and friendship, and he was born separately from the Brood hive mind, meaning he is not loyal to a brood queen. He also possesses super genius levels of intelligence, making him one of the smartest students at Jean Grey's school for higher learning. So, Brew's X gene mutation is only really mental or psychological in nature, but being a brood, he brings natural body armor and fanged jaws to a fight, and recently, Brew actually consumed a king egg, making him king of the entire brood species, including the brood queens. Number 6. Big Bertha Bertha Crawford, originally Ashley Crawford, until she changed her name, had the mutant ability of total control over her body's physical size and mass. She can add or take away hundreds of pounds to herself at will, controlling her figure. This allowed her to become the highest paid fashion model in America at one point, but also allowed her to don the Big Bertha superhero persona. Using her abilities to add bulk and mass, she actually increases her durability and her strength to a peak of lifting.
lifting 50 tons, allowing her to jump huge distances like the Hulk. No matter what size Bertha alters herself to though, she has a high level of athleticism. Ashley rebranded herself into a plus size model, which is when she changed her name to Bertha. And you know what? She still kind of killed it. Good job. Number five, Tara. Tara Markov was a member of the Teen Titans, but unbeknownst to her teammates, she was actually the protege of the team's arch nemesis, Deathstroke. She was feeding information to Deathstroke, which he used to capture the Titans, but when Deathstroke's son, Jericho, used his powers of possession to use Deathstroke to free the Titans, Tara thought she was being betrayed by her mentor and snapped, collapsing the hive complex they were in down around her and crushing herself to death. Tara had the power of geokinesis, which means that she she could earth bend. She used this power to throw rocks, which she could also sharpen to deadly points with her mind, and could even cause earthquakes at will. She could use this power to rip rock or earth from the ground, which she would stand on and cause to fly at great speeds, giving her the power of flight. Years after her death, she was made a member of the Black Lantern Corps, and her zombified corpse returned to life with the powers of a Black Lantern ring in addition to her usual power set. Number four, Dex Star. Dex Star started life as a stray cat in Brooklyn. He was adopted by a woman who took him in and gave him a pretty wonderful life full of love and yarn. When his owner passed away in a home invasion gone wrong, Dex found himself back on the streets. When two rather cruel humans decided to have some fun by putting him in a sack and throwing him off of a bridge, a red lantern ring, sensing the rage in the cat's heart, granted Dex the powers of a red lantern. Dex Star has since become a regular member of the Red Lantern Corps and is probably the most powerful cat in the DC Universe. And don't underestimate him. He is extremely brutal and violent and is responsible for the deaths of several humans, a yellow lantern and at least one black lantern. Although he has sworn vengeance for the life of his original owner, he still enjoys a good cuddle from his new master, Atrocitus. Despite Atrocitus's typical brutality, he shows a real soft spot for his cat, often referring to him as a good kitty, and flying into a rage if anyone hurts him. Normally I'd say this makes Dex a pet, not a sidekick, but I think he qualifies as both. I mean Superboy's sidekick for years was Crypto the Superdog, so I think this counts. Number three, Inertia. Thaddeus Thawne is a clone made up of Thawne and Bart Allen's DNA in the 30th century. His power is to slow down time around him, giving him the appearance of super speed. He operates as an independent villain for the various flashes, even managing to kill Impulse before being captured by Wally West, who slowed him down to the point where he was essentially a statue, which Wally then put on display at the Flash Museum, forced to look at a statue of the speedster hero he killed for the rest of time. He was eventually freed by Hunter Zolomon, aka Zoom. Zoom then took Inertia under his wing, renaming him Kid Zoom. Although very powerful, his time as Kid Zoom was cut short when he killed Weather Wizard's son, resulting in the rogues teaming up and taking him out with extreme prejudice. Number two, Christoph Vernard. When Doctor Doom returned to Latveria in Fantastic Four number 247, he discovered that a revolution had taken place, and he had been replaced by a man named Zorba Fortunov. He came across a young boy named Kristoff and his mother, who were still loyal to their former leader. Kristoff's mother was killed by a robot, and once he had regained control of his homeland, Doctor Doom took in Kristoff, raised him, and eventually made him his heir. Kristoff is a super genius, much like his teacher, having a knowledge of science and magic that apparently rivals even the original Doom. When Doom was killed in battle, Kristoff was made the new Doctor Doom, but the Doom bots transferred Doom's memories into Kristoff making him think that he was the real Doom. This of course led to trouble when the real Doom returned, and upon defeating Kristoff, Doom had him deposed and sent into exile. But the two eventually patched things up, with Kristoff stepping in as, as Latveria's interim leader whenever Von Doom is unavailable. Number 1. Nimona Nimona is the lead character of the graphic novel of the same name by N.D. Stevenson. It tells the story of a young girl who decides that she wants to be the sidekick of the greatest villain in the realm, Ballister Blackheart. She has magical powers that allow her to shapeshift. She can use this power to disguise herself as someone else, or to become any animal she wants. She's only limited in the fact that the animal has to be a real creature. But that's not much of a 
limit, as she lives in a world where dragons are real. She also has an incredible healing factor, having healed arrow wounds and a decapitated head with little to no trouble. The story soon goes in a direction where it is clear that Blackheart and Nimona are operating as villains in order to liberate their homeland from an evil dictatorship, which of course opens up a lot of thematic ideas of what actually makes people villains. But it is a cool read that has been adapted into an animated Netflix film, which is scheduled to be released sometime this year. All right, kicking off the list at number 10 today is Martian Manhunter. Now look, Martian Manhunter may be one of the main Justice League members, but he gets slept on way too much. I will always reference this when describing John's power, but there is a panel from the New 52 when Martian Manhunter is fighting off all the members of the Justice League at the same time. With his left hand, Manhunter is using his shape-shifting ability to turn that hand into a massive spiked club and whacking away both Cyborg and Green Lantern. With his right hand, I think it's safe to say he's showing off his super strength as he's got a power grip on the Lasso of Truth and I'm assuming he's just resisting its power. Behind him is Aquaman who's like jabbing John with his trident, but the trident is just phasing through him because John can become intangible. Then we got Superman who's like flying around the fight at a decent distance while Manhunter uses his heat vision to keep him there. And then the funniest part is Batman doing absolutely nothing, just picking up the Flash, who seems to have just been knocked down. It's almost a perfect display of his abilities, but leaving out a handful and one of the biggest. John is the most powerful telepath on Earth, and one of the most powerful in the entire universe. Martian Manhunter has been called the most powerful being on the planet, and he's at the top of the list of people that Superman is afraid to fight. Number nine, Booster Gold. Poor old Booster Gold, the greatest hero that you've probably never heard of. His day job involves traveling through time and space ensuring that events that are meant to happen do happen, and he absolutely rocks at it. There was even a time that Booster went so far as to create an entire second persona named Supernova for himself while simultaneously faking a psychological breakdown and eventually faking the passing of his own Booster Gold identity, all while he went and successfully replaced several major superheroes who were missing at the time, including Superman. The thing about Booster Gold is that in order to protect himself from other time travelers, Booster has to come across as a failure, an absolute dumpster fire of mediocrity. Somebody that no one will ever want to bother with remembering anything about in the future. That's why Booster has this shtick of being greedy, incompetent, and attention sinking, which actually kind of began as genuine, but has long since been a facade. He willingly endures a life of ridicule from the people he protects without them knowing because when you're dealing with time travel, being the butt of the joke actually gives you an advantage. Booster is also called upon to maintain events which are pretty much less than excellent, like ensuring that bad things that have to happen actually happen. For example, he routinely guards a little German baby boy born on the 20th of April 1889 in a small town in Austria-Hungary from other first-time time-traveling superheroes. He does all of those things because the alternative is the complete unraveling of all time and space and the destruction of everything. Number eight, Granny Goodness. Stepping away from Marvel for a moment, Granny Goodness is probably the complete opposite of anything we would describe as goodness. She was originally one of the lowlies, which is basically the peasant class on DC Universe's apocalypse. From a younger age, she was taken by Darkseid and raised and trained to become head of the Shock Troops and the Female Furies. She has the responsibility to bring young warriors from other worlds to fight each other to earn the right to be trained by her. But Granny Goodness also has multiple orphanages where she both trains and disciplines younger individuals, looking for potential warriors for Darkseid. Now being a resident of Apocalypse, Granny here does have quite a bit of power. She has superhuman strength, speed, durability, and senses, as well as invulnerability and an advanced immune system and immortality. But being immortal doesn't necessarily save you from looking old as hell, which is why we get granny goodness. Number seven, horticulture. You know, sometimes a group of villains comes along that just kind of makes me smile. And horticulture, who first appeared in X-Men Volume 5, number three in December 2019, are one such group. Horticulture is described on their wiki as a group of agrochemists, biotechnologists, and eugenic engineers who specialize in the genetic manipulation and propagation of all things botanical. So, to me and my tiny brain, I take that information and translate it to, it's a bunch of old plant scientist ladies. 
because that's what they are. It's a bunch of older ladies who are seeking to radically depopulate humans from the earth in order to bring the earth and nature to a state of balance. With the climate the way it is right now, it's actually kind of an understandable cause, even if it's utterly insane. Using their know-how, they made biological modifications to themselves like resistance to telepathy and extended lifespans, but they also developed technology to manipulate their environment, inhibit mutant powers, and generate illusions on men. But they also have experience as computer programmers, being able to access the Krakoan gateways and trade information with the villainous anti-mutant group known as Orcus. Number six, old Loki from the MCU. All right, I'm going to step away from the pages of comic books altogether here. During the MCU's Loki show, Loki gets sent to the void, where the whole place is basically filled with other alternate versions of himself. But he specifically became part of a group of four other Lokis. Boastful Loki, Alligator Loki, Kid Loki, and the topic for today, Classic Loki. Classic Loki had a similar story to regular Loki from the Sacred Timeline, but when confronted by Thanos in Avengers Infinity War, this Loki decided to use duplication magic to survive the whole thing. He then spent a hell of a long time on a remote planet, ashamed of the nefarious things he had done over time. When he finally tried to return to see his brother, Thor, who he missed, he was an older man, and them meeting caused a divergent timeline, getting himself pruned and sent to the void. He he has probably one of the best moments in the show. When Sylvie, Loki, and Mobius try to escape from the void, and the reality consuming Eliath tries to stop them, classic Loki uses his magic to create a true to life, massive illusion of Asgard itself. All while this weird version of Ride of the Valkyries was playing in the background, distracting Eliath and giving me just straight up goosebumps. Like, I am actually getting them right now just thinking about it. Like, it was such a cool moment. <sighs> Satisfying. Number five, Ra's al Ghul. Ra's al Ghul was born around 700 years ago, and thanks to the Lazarus Pits, he has been able to keep his body in working order. But he discovered the pits when he was an older gentleman and keeps the look of someone with a significant amount of years to him. After he came in contact with the pits, he eventually became a master martial artist and a master fencer, gaining a massive amount of wealth, and he started creating organizations to rid the world of crime with his first being being called the Demon, which the later League of Assassins is a branch of. Rage's purpose within the League of Assassins is to eliminate all evil in the world by destroying all of humanity and just starting all over. Obviously, that mentality means he routinely has run-ins with the superhero community, especially Batman, who he helped train. Rage has had many plans over the years that tried to destroy the world, and he has also beaten the entire JLA when he discovered Batman's notes. Now, with his years of experience and his vast amount of accumulated resources, this older fellow is a massive threat to both the heroes and the world. Number four, the Joker. During the absolutely fantastic three Jokers storyline, we learn there have actually been three Jokers plaguing Gotham over the years. And among the three of them is the Golden Age Joker, and he is clearly much older than the other two. Now, to be completely transparent here, whether this story is canon or not is an area of debate, so it's up to you if this one counts. But the Golden Age Joker, known as the Criminal, is the only one of the three Jokers to be a predominantly serious crime lord. And he even says that laughing and smiling is physically painful for him. Another thing that makes this entry a little arguable is that of these three Jokers, we don't know which one, if any of them, is the Joker. Even if only one remains in the end, the best part of this story is the uncertainty about which one is the one who started it all. Now, seeing as the Criminal is the oldest classic version, he seems to be the one who started it all, creating more Jokers to mess with Batman. But the other two Jokers have been featured in incredibly important Batman stories as well. The comic really explores all of it, and if you haven't yet, make sure you check out Batman 3 Jokers as soon as possible. Number three, Maestro. The Incredible Hulk has certainly been through the ringer in his decorated career, but few versions of the character are the living embodiment of that fact, like the Maestro. An alternate version of Bruce Banner from an apocalyptic future, this version of the character is far more intense and complex, but also, much older. The best way to explain Maestro is to say that he is basically a smarter, older, villainous version of Dr. Bruce Banner with all the powers and abilities of the original, but with a 
touch of nuclear radiation. He has much more of a cosmic and spiritual side to him than the normal Hulk does, but he is also twice as strong as Hulk is and he retains all the intelligence of Bruce Banner, but with years and years more experience. Despite all that extra strength, brain power, and experience, he still gets outmaneuvered by the Hulk who sends Maestro back in time to the site of the gamma bomb that created them. But even then, the Maestro spirit remains on the bones left behind after the explosion went off and he came back to life. Number two, Agatha Harkness. Like a few of these villains, when we first met Agatha Harkness in Fantastic Four number 94 from October of 1969, she was already elderly. She started out as the nanny for the newly born Franklin Richards, and using her magical powers, she even saved the Fantastic Four from the Frightful Four and a handful of other villains, and also helped Franklin when his powers first started to emerge. But she went on to have an interesting relationship with the Scarlet Witch, Wanda Maximoff, but also her mother, Natalia Maximoff. Off. That's because this sweet nanny Agatha is actually an incredibly ancient sorcerer who was around to remember the sinking of Atlantis nearly 18,000 years ago. And she was probably the most powerful of the original witches during the Salem Witch Trials, an event that she actually supported as she thought it would call the weak magic users who held them back. Agatha, like a lot of older villains, is pretty damn complex. She has helped out heroes on multiple occasions, but she's also done some pretty sinister stuff. But there's no doubt that she she is much stronger than both heroes and villains first assume. Number one, Baron Von Strucker. Baron Wolfgang Von Strucker was born in the 19th century, so he ain't a young fella by any means. He fought with the Axis powers during World War II alongside and under the Red Skull. He was a top villain at the time, not just for Captain America, but more prominently as an adversary for Nick Fury and the Howling Commandos. And that carried through after the war ended as Strucker was instrumental in the rise of Hydra and then became the Supreme Hydra. He was even responsible for the corruption of S.H.I.E.L.D. using Hydra to completely take over large parts of S.H.I.E.L.D. itself. When Captain America returned and then the Red Skull did as well, Strucker began to lose his leadership role within Hydra and so he faked his own passing, choosing to instead manipulate events from the shadows. Eventually though, Strucker got the Death Spore virus, which is why he is on this list. He's old and many people don't know he has this particular enhancement. While he is an excellent strategist, a highly intelligent, exceptional hand-to-hand -hand combatant, swordsman, and marksman who uses Hydra tech to live longer and be in top physical condition, the Death Spore virus bonded Strucker's DNA with the Death Spore itself, enabling him to be revived after passing away. He hasn't aged since getting the virus, he heals at an incredible rate, is invulnerable to minor injuries, resistant to toxins and disease, and he can even release the Death Spore virus from his body at will, taking his victims' lives nearly instantly if he chooses to. Number 10, North Star and Aurora. Look at me cheating right out the gate. North Star and Aurora are mutant twins who have the same powers, which is why they are listed together. Jean-Marie and Jean-Paul Bobier were separated early in life when their their parents died in a car accident. Jean-Paul ended up in foster homes before eventually becoming an Olympic skier, while Jean-Marie ended up at a strict Catholic girls boarding school, which was so traumatic that she ended up developing dissociative identity disorder, creating an alternate personality known as Aurora. Each twin possesses super speed as well as the ability to fly. Because some readers are likely more familiar with North Star due to his time on the X-Men, away from his sister, they may be surprised to learn that when the twins link hands, they produce an intensely bright light that can be used to blind their enemies, making them even more powerful as a pair. Number nine. Sasquatch. Walter Lankowski was a brilliant and athletic student at Penn State on a football scholarship when he struck up a friendship with a fellow student named Bruce Banner. The two went their separate ways, but Banner inspired a fascination with gamma radiation in Walter. Walter became a player for the Green Bay Packers before retiring to finish his graduate studies at MIT. Fascinated by the Hulk, Walter decided to conduct a similar, though more controlled, gamma experiment on himself. This transformed him into the incredibly strong creature known as Sasquatch. Although at first glance he seems to simply be a knockoff of Hulk, due to the help of his teammate Snowbird, Walter is able to keep the beast at bay and retain his genius intellect when in his Sasquatch form, something the Hulk is only occasionally capable of in the comics. This makes him more than a blunt instrument, often helping the team just as much as a genius scientist. Number eight. 
Thunder. This one's a bit of a journey, so stick with me. In World War II, Lewis Sadler became Major Maple Leaf, who was the Canadian equivalent to Captain America. He had limited invulnerability as well as super strength, which made him a true force to be reckoned with on the battlefield. Many years later, his son, Lewis Sadler Jr., would take on the Major Maple Leaf mantle. When the original Alpha Flight team was kidnapped by a group of aliens, Sasquatch recruited the new Major Maple Leaf to join a new version of the team in an effort to mount a rescue mission. It was assumed that he had the same powers as his father, as well as power blasts and the ability to fly. But it turned out that the new Major didn't actually have any powers. Not that he would ever admit it. No, it turned out that the one with powers was actually his magical horse, Thunder. Thunder the Super Equine has all the aforementioned powers as well as extremely high intelligence for a horse. So like the equivalent intelligence of a normal person. He can also communicate basic messages to the Major through meaningful gazes. Thunder is pretty chill about Major Maple Leaf stealing his, well, Thunder, and remained Sadler's faithful steed for the duration of the character's run. Number 7, Hornet. Hobby Brown is a hero who does not get enough love, not by a long shot. He recently appeared alongside the Slingers in the Amazing Spider-Man series during the Beyond event. He appeared in a side story that was featured in one of the Point Bays, or perhaps I should say the Point Bees, since that's short for Beyond. I still like saying Point Bay though. Hobby is known for his genius intellect, although he initially thought a life of crime was the right way to go with that, adopting the identity of the Prowler on Earth 616. But Spider Man was quick to encourage his reform, even giving him work impersonating Spider Man to protect Peter Parker's secret identity. He initially used his genius to build his first suit, which was where he basically got his powers from, possessing, you know, no superpowers himself. He has since also built his newest suit for his heroic mantle of Hornet. And honestly, I'm really hoping we get to see more of him and the Slingers in the comics soon. The Slingers are so cool. Number six. Huntress. For this version of Huntress, we are focusing on Helena Bertinelli, who unbeknownst to her had grown up in a mafia household. When a hit was put on her family, she was one of the only people that survived, and really only survived by accident. She trained in the old country of Sicily, being taken in by her father and uncle, but eventually learned the truth of her own family's involvement with the mafia, and learned that the mafia was not really good, but a source of corruption and evil. When she returned to Gotham to visit a family as a teenager over the holidays, she witnessed Batman attack her family, and rightfully so, she thought. She didn't really like her family. <laughs> Inspired by him and the fear that he created, she decided to follow in his footsteps and become a vigilante with her life devoted to wiping out the mafia in order to get her revenge. Number 5, Elektra. Elektra is often thought of as more of a villain in the comics and more of a dead villain really since well, she's mostly famous for kind of dying and thereby breaking Daredevil's heart as she was his lover, his former lover. In fact, she was the first love that Daredevil ever really lost, which has kind of become his thing. Although, even before she died, she was kind of lost to Matt Murdock in terms of their love story anyways. Elektra was pulled to the side of darkness, but would later return in the comics and has since turned to the side of good, even walking in Matt's footsteps and donning his cowl, becoming herself a version of Daredevil. Number 4, The Question. The Question has been asked by a few different people over the years. And honestly, The Question is a character that probably doesn't get enough love on this channel. Whether we're talking about Vic Sage, who ran lives again despite having previously died from cancer, or Renee Montoya, his GCPD detective, who was his former love interest, who was later revealed to be gay, and then later followed in her mentor Sage's footsteps, or the other one, the nameless one, who was kind of less cool than either of the other iterations in my opinion. The question is an interesting character. While things got a little too magical with the newest version of the character, I've always loved that the original question was both a master detective, but also somewhat mystical as well well, having much knowledge of things both spiritual and supernatural gathered through his travels. While not particularly well known for his fighting style, Vic did train Rene Montoya, who was already a pretty good fighter, being a trained boxer and police officer who also became a skilled martial artist, and even at one point managed to hold her own for a period of time in a fight against Lady Shiva, with Shiva even remarking on how the fight was more interesting than she initially expected. Which from Lady Shiva, hey, that's a compliment. Number 3, Moon Knight. Moon Knight is a hero who many people now have more respect for thanks to his appearance in the MCU in his own series, Moon Knight. Here he is depicted as a man divided who brings all sides of himself together to take on god level threats. If that isn't strong, 
I do not know what is. But even in the comics, Moon Knight has always had this potential really. While street level in terms of the types of fights that he generally picks across personas, he also has an origin and background steeped in the supernatural and in mysticism. A lot of people think of Moon Knight as kind of just like a crazy guy who was really good at beating people up, but in reality he potentially gains power from the moon due to his connection to the as of now confirmed to be real god known as Khonshu. Aside from that, Moon Knight has also literally had to fight gods, even having to fight against his own god during Age of Khonshu. This likely has dampened his power source somewhat as Khonshu is currently locked away, but Moon Knight still remains a powerful hero regardless. Number 2 Batwoman Batwoman doesn't get hyped a lot on our channel unless we're talking about the Bat family or queer representation in comics I feel. At least speaking for my own list and when I find I tend to talk about Batwoman, but she deserves to be hyped just for being a powerful hero in her own right. Kate Kane is the cousin of Bruce Wayne, and I just realized that their names rhyme. Kate Kane, Bruce Wayne, what the heck? She was kicked out of the military for being gay and ended up deciding to put her skills and abilities to good use as a vigilante instead. What's even more impressive is that although Kate only ever wanted to serve after losing her mom and her sister, she actually admits to being gay as opposed to hiding it, which is what causes her to have to leave the military. She couldn't bring herself to lie about it, and honestly, this shows one of Kate's greatest strengths and most prominent traits honor. Kate Kane is a hero even skilled fighters like Cassandra Kane look up to, and she's proven to be skilled enough to take out an unsuspecting Batgirl aka Barbara Gordon, which is no easy feat. Barbara Gordon is a pretty impressive fighter. Number 1 Danny Rand or Daniel Rand if we're being formal. While I do sometimes like to poke fun at Danny Rand, the fact remains that he is insanely OP, especially for being a street level superhero. While no longer the Iron Fist currently in the comics, Danny Rand for a long time was the guy you thought of when you thought the words Iron Fist. He's defeated dragons! Even without the Iron Fist power though, he is still a master martial artist who could probably only be rivaled in terms of his skill by the likes of someone else just as gifted, someone like another deadly martial artist superhero like Shang-Chi. Rand has complete control of his nervous system and can also withstand pain and achieve a sense of control over his body using meditation techniques. His senses are so great and attuned that he doesn't even need to be able to see his opponent to fight them, and he has been said to be a master of cheat. Number 10, the Hex. Okay, so this is kind of cheating, as the Hex are actually a group of six Eternals, and also, while the other Eternals resemble humans, for the most part, the Hex are more like gargantuan war machines. The six of these female Eternals, Femex, Tetitrona 3000, Rika Centaurus, Fieka the Harpiscus, Phoebe Reginax, and Sine the Memotar, I'm sorry if I mispronounced any of those, are all powered by cosmic energy, just like the rest of the Eternals, and also like the other Eternals, they each have have more specific skills. Themex is described as an orbital annihilator. Tetitrona can deploy destruction nodes. Rika is like a kind of druid being able to manipulate plant life, making plant creatures to attack other people, which is kind of cool. Fieka is incredibly good at becoming intangible. Phoebe is a magic user. And last but not least, Sign can manipulate fire for both destruction but also creation. Don't ask me how. Number 9, the Delphin Brothers. The Delphin Brothers are, again, another interesting Eternal, or Eternals. It's a little confusing because while they started out as just one Eternal, their mother, the Delphin Mother, duplicated the Eternal into four clones, which was something other Eternals were not too happy about. In some stories, there have been at least eight of these guys, but that was retconned in a recent run, so it is just four. The best part is that they are usually shown to be a little childish, and they're always just kind of there, used as like muscle or to do bidding for another whoever is in charge. The four of these Eternals have all basic Eternal abilities with no speciality other than being copies of each other. They don't get individual names and they almost always wear the same clothes, so they are completely interchangeable with one another. Number 8, Psychos. In 2000, Marvel released New Eternals Apocalypse Now, which I think was supposed to revamp the Eternals as it put together a new group of Eternals with some of favorites and made them a new team of superheroes called the New Breed. One of these Eternals was called Psychos, or as his superhero alter ego, Psyche. As you can tell, Marvel was being extremely creative with this new team of Eternals, so surprisingly, Psyche had an affinity for psionic abilities. 
He has shown the power to probe minds, manipulate the bodies of people against their will, and alter people's perceptions, as well as having the regular eternal powers. He was also the most edgy member of the team, as he was arrogant, short tempered, and was considered reckless. I'm sure he would have probably become a villain if this team gained any popularity. Number 7. Wind Shear Colin Ashworth is a mutant with the power to transform air into hard air. He transforms this hardened air into various shapes, which he can use for both attack and defense when in battle. He has used this ability to create concussive blasts, which he uses to attack his enemies and to fly. He has also used this hard air to create shields and battering rams, as well as hard air bullets and needles that he launches at his foes. While all of this is useful, his most devastating attack is his ability to alter the gases in a person's body, causing their blood to become as thick as glue. Although he started as an employee of the villainous Roxxon Corporation, he eventually became disillusioned with the violent acts they were forcing him to perform and quit so that he could join Alpha Flight. When Alpha Flight disbanded, Windshear retired to England where he began selling sculptures and trinkets that he created with his powers. He eventually became bored with this simple life and adopted the new superhero persona of Chinook. Number 6. Centennial Ruby Princeton III was in a coma for 15 years until Sasquatch, while trying to find members for his new Alpha Flight team, noticed his unique biorhythmic signature and revived him. At some point in the years he was in a coma, Rudy had developed superpowers. Although the 96 year old originally wanted no part of the superhero lifestyle, he soon found that with his new powers, living a normal life would be quite dull, and joined the team becoming the Centennial. As a retired police officer, Rudy has acquired a wealth of experience in combat, which perfectly complements his superhuman strength and speed, invulnerability, flight, and heat vision. Basically, he's a geriatric superman. Number 5. Wire Wire's true identity is still unknown, but what we do know is that he started out as a genetically enhanced assassin with enhanced strength, speed, agility, and reflexes, as well as the ability to launch and control tendrils of inorganic fiber from his body. This, combined with his incredible fighting skills, weapons knowledge, and claws, made him a dangerous person to have as an enemy. He was hired to create a group of superhuman killers for the secret empire, but he eventually felt remorseful for his actions and began hunting down the creatures he helped create. This brought him into conflict with Alpha Flight, as one of these creatures, Wild Child, was operating as a member of the team called Weapon Omega. They eventually came to an uneasy truce, and Wire joined the team for a time, although tensions between him and his teammates always remained high. Number 4. Box Roger Box was a gifted inventor who was confined to a wheelchair after both of his legs were amputated. Not wanting to be limited to his chair, he created the Box robot, which he developed with the help of James Hudson, aka Guardian. Box operates with the use of a helmet which projects Roger's consciousness into the robot. The robot is incredibly strong and essentially invulnerable and is able to fly and is equipped with powerful blasters. Box was recruited to Beta Flight, the group trainees are put in when they are just about to graduate to Alpha. Alpha Flight, but lost out on his chance to be a hero when Pierre Elliott Trudeau defunded Department H. Roger was recruited by the evil Jerome Jackson to join his supervillain team, Omega Flight, a group dedicated to killing James Hudson. Roger joined the group hoping to infiltrate them and help save Hudson. Jackson discovered his duplicitous nature and stole the box robot to fight Guardian in the infamous Alpha Flight number 12, which resulted in both Guardian and Jackson seemingly being killed. Roger later joined Alpha a flight, creating an advanced version of the box that didn't require a control helmet and that the user could instead phase into. Box eventually suffered a psychotic break which resulted in him being lobotomized by the villainous Scramble and eventually killed by fellow teammate Madison Jeffries. Number 3. Wild Child Kyle Gibney was the subject of several experiments by the Secret Empire who were trying to create the perfect killer. Although he was already a mutant with a freakish appearance, the experiments made Kyle a feral beast of a man who eventually rebelled and destroyed the Empire's headquarters. He was later found by Department H and placed in the entry-level training group, Gamma Flight. When the group disbanded, he was one of the people recruited for Jerome Jackson's Omega Flight and was one of the enemies that Alpha Flight fought and captured in Alpha Flight number 12. 
himself. He was later pardoned by the government and allowed to join a government sanctioned Gamma flight after Alpha flight had gone private and were assumed dead. The two teams eventually combined and his teammate Nemesis helped him overcome his bestial nature and took away his deformities and he became Weapon Omega. His animalistic nature and appearance soon returned and he quit the team, becoming Wild Child once again and eventually joining the Weapon X program. Like similar mutants, like Wolverine and Sabretooth, Wild Child has a powerful healing factor as well as enhanced strength, speed and stamina, as well as enhanced hearing and sense of smell, and razor sharp claws and fangs. Number 2. Persuasion when the evil Purple Man, Zebediah Kilgrave, fell in love with a woman named Melanie, he used his mind control powers to make Melanie fall in love with him, and they spent the next few months together. When Kilgrave released her from his control, she did what many Americans only threaten to do when they lose an election, and moved to Canada. She gave birth to Kilgrave's daughter, Kara, who seemed like a normal girl with a normal complexion. When she was a teenager, however, her skin turned purple, and she began producing the pheromones that allowed her to control people. Like her father, Kara can force people people to do whatever she wants due to the pheromones that she is secreting. Rather than become a supervillain, she chose to use these powers for good, being recruited to Beta Squad before eventually graduating to the main team. She was briefly coerced into villainy when the evil master of the world brainwashed her and made her join his evil team, Alpha Strike. After this brief stint, she eventually joined the new Thunderbolts. Number 1. Vindicator when she was first introduced in X-Men number 139, Heather Hudson seemed like little more than Guardian's supportive wife, but the more we learned about her in subsequent appearances, the more integral to the team she became. When James Hudson was working for AmCam Oil on his geological exploration suit, Heather McNeil was working as his boss, Jerome Jackson's secretary. She was smitten with James, and when he learned that his suit was going to be sold as a weapon and quit, she resigned too, being impressed with his strong morals. It was her idea to approach Department H for help, which led to the creation of Alpha Flight. When the team was defunded, it was Heather that brought them back together to battle the evil Tundra. She continued on in a support role before her husband was seemingly killed. In order to carry on his legacy, she was given a similar battle suit and became the new leader of the team, Vindicator. From humble beginnings, she has managed to become one of Canada's greatest heroes. In Alpha Flight Volume 2, she was given a new suit which gave her the added ability to control volcanic and seismic activity. Number 10. Manbot when the secretive and often shady branch of the Canadian government, known as Department H, gained access to the box robot, they took one of their employees, named Bernie Lachenay, and merged him with the robot. This resulted in most of Bernie's personality being lost and he became Manbot. As a computer-machine-human hybrid, Manbot has several abilities that make him a valuable member of the team. Not only can he fly and process an enormous amount of data really quick, but he's also able to shoot both missiles and energy blasts at his enemies and incapacitate his foes with a nerve toxin. As he is mostly a machine, he's also immune to mind control, as he showed in Alpha Flight Volume 2, Issue 4, when he was the only member of the team Team who was able to resist the mind control powers of the villain Mesmero. Number 9. Yukon Jack When Walter Lankowski, aka Sasquatch, was forced to assemble a new Alpha Flight team when the original squad was kidnapped by aliens, he approached the heir to the throne of a secret civilization in the village of Chemteron. Yuko Tujak Zurji Mozo Ada showed no interest in leaving his home, but Walter bribed the chief to drug his son and allow him to take him to the outside world so he could become more worldly. Nicknamed Yukon Jack, Jack, he joined the newly formed team and using his considerable combat skills, in addition to his powers which allow him to telekinetically control the bone pieces covering his body, he is also able to survive in sub-zero temperatures and can cast light from his hands. Number 8. Radius Jared Corbo is a mutant who was raised with his half-brother Adrian in the East Ontario town of Orlu at an orphanage called Hull House, or as the orphans nicknamed it, Hell House. Unbeknownst to most of the residents, Hull House was actually being operated by Department H as a way to find and recruit members for their various superhero teams, sometimes waiting until the orphans were of age, and sometimes having them adopted by the department so they could participate while underage. Which sounds bad, but when you think of 
about it is pretty much exactly what Professor X is doing. Jared's mutant powers allow him to create a force field which he is incapable of shutting off. While this protected him from harm, it also meant that he could not touch or be touched by others and was unable to effectively shower and couldn't eat without wearing a special eating filter which converted the food to a form that could get through the field, allowing Jared to get the necessary nutrients he needed to survive. Jared can also extend the field in order to use it offensively by either crushing things in a move he calls the Nutcracker Special, or by creating powerful ranged attacks. Number 7. Snowbird In an effort to save the Earth from the mystical great beasts, the Inuit goddess of the Northern Lights, Nelvana, mated with a human in order to create a daughter, Naria, who came to the Earth to protect Canada from the evil great beasts. She took on the secret identity of a RCMP officer named Anne Mackenzie, and soon joined the original Alpha Flight team as Snowbird. Snowbird's most well-known ability is to transform herself into any animal found in Northern Canada, taking on its mass and strength, as well as any of the animal's other abilities. Some of her transformations include polar bears, owls, and whales. She can also turn into mystical Canadian creatures, giving her the power to become the dangerous and incredibly powerful Wendigo. Beyond these more well-known powers, she also possesses super strength in her human form, as well as post-cognition, which is the ability to see events that have transpired in the past at a given location. In Snowbird's case, she can see up to six hours in the past. Although this weakness no longer applies, Snowbird used to grow weak and sick if she was taken outside of Canada's borders. Number 6. Talisman Elizabeth Two Young Men is the estranged daughter of Shaman, who reluctantly joined Alpha Flight and began working with her father. She eventually reached into the Shaman's mystical pouch and found the Coronet of Enchantment, transforming Elizabeth into Talisman. Although she cannot remove the tiara without suffering excruciating pain, it grants her the ability to cast several impressive spells. Some of these spells give her the abilities of levitation, teleportation, and matter manipulation, just to name a few. Although her father can ask spirits to act on his behalf, the coronet also gives Talisman the power to make spirits do what she wants. And number five is Jessica Jones. Jessica Jones is an Avenger who's been on the sidelines for way too long. You might have recognized her from her Netflix series, but in the comics, she's a powerhouse. Super strength, durability, and some mean investigative skills. Yet she's often overshadowed by big names like Iron Man and Thor. Now, while she's not out there space battling aliens, her street level heroics are just as vital. Imagine if she had just a little more screen time and a chance to shine alongside the heavier hitters. Jessica Jones deserves way more recognition and a bigger role in the MCU. At number four is War Machine. Now many people just think of War Machine as sort of an Iron Man light, but he deserves way more credit than that. I mean, come on, his name is literally War Machine. The guy's suit of armor is loaded with firepower. Sure, he doesn't have the same level of tech or even charisma as Tony Stark, but he's a vital member of the team. Think about it, War Machine is a military asset that brings a different set of skills to the table. He's got the experience, the discipline, and the tactical know-how. Plus, the suit of his can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with some serious threats. So let's not forget about War Machine when we talk about the Avengers, because he's definitely one of the strongest and deserves a lot more recognition. And number three is Jack of Hearts, recommended by Robert Pike 5670. Now, now, the Jack of Hearts isn't your typical Avenger. See, he's got this super crazy cosmic power, like he can manipulate energy and stuff. Sort of like he's a walking nuclear reactor. But here's the thing, he's always kind of been underrated despite his insanely powerful superpowers. He's been in and out of the Avengers, never really getting the spotlight he deserves. I mean, okay, just imagine having that kind of power and not being in the spotlight. It's like having a Lamborghini and just keeping it in the garage, am I right? The Jack of Hearts is definitely one of the strongest Avengers, period, and it's about time he got the recognition he deserves. And number two is Madam Web. There's one character who's been lurking in the shadows, and I'm not talking about a stealthy superhero. I'm talking about Cassandra Webb here, AKA Madame Webb. Now, Madame Webb is kind of like the unsung hero of the Marvel Universe. See, she's got this crazy ability to see into the future and across the multiverse. Basically, she's the ultimate guidance counselor for Spider-Man. But here's the thing, folks, she's been nowhere to be found in the movies. Not in the MCU, not in the Spider-Verse films, nada. I mean, Come on, with her powers, 
she could have helped the Avengers dodge a lot of disasters. So let's hope one day Madam Web gets her time in the spotlight because she's the unsung hero in the background who deserves a lot more love on the big screen in the foreground. And at number one is Black Widow. Honestly, I'm stunned that nobody mentioned Natasha Romanoff in the comments of part one, which is surprising because if there's any superhero who got relegated to the sidelines during the entire run of the MCU, it's Natasha Romanoff. Now, what's impressive about her is that she's just a regular human being, no superpowers, yet she's keeping pace with all of these superhuman heavy hitters. But here's the kicker. She even went as far as to sacrifice herself during Infinity War, way before she even got her own solo film. Like, talk about a major oof. I mean, sure, eventually we got that prequel, but I mean, it would have been nice to see her come back at the end of Endgame. She deserved a lot more screen time, don't you think? You see, the strongest superheroes aren't just the ones with the flashiest powers, and Black Widow, being a human who just basically went to the gym her entire life, definitely proved that. Mm -hmm.